Welcome to another episode of Exploring the Vintage NFT Space podcast with Zero G. Today, I'm excited to have with me uh, uh, Mackenzie. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks. It's uh, great to be here. Did I pronounce your, your name correctly? Uh, it's uh, McKechnie. McKechnie. Okay, my bad. Um, yeah, That's the so, easiest name. <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, that doesn't look quite right, so I had to ask. Um, yeah, so I uh, excited to talk to you today. We've uh, we've talked offline a couple times before, and I wanted to kind of uh, I wanted to record it to to bring your experience and understanding to a greater audience because I think it it's um, it runs really counter to a lot of the the understanding and the the like the projections that are going on or the the group think as you you put it like going on right now in the um, in the space around VR and, and kind of the future of intersection of some of these technologies and where we're at right now. So, um, but before we do that, why don't we, uh, you're also a, uh, a, a, a fake commons artist. So uh, why don't you tell me first about how you, how you found out about crypto and, and what was your, uh, what was the motivation that actually got you to, to make your first purchase? Oh man. Well, uh, Crypto has been a long journey. Uh, I got really interested in uh, money and banking right out of college in uh, 2005 mm -hmm. and uh, fell into the like Ron Paul YouTube time where that was all that was given fed to me. So I learned a lot about central banks and uh, I ended up watching uh, Max Kaiser for years when he was on his uh, Russia Today show. Uh, yeah. I actually forget what it was even called at this point is so long ago, but I used to watch him, uh, every show that would come out. And, uh, so I actually kind of like discovered Bitcoin watching Max Kaiser discover Bitcoin. Oh, that's cool. So, I, yeah. yeah. I, um, I, I definitely remember watching Max back in the day. And, um, I remember when he was talking about Bitcoin and, and he also, I think maybe it was before that he was talking about like the, he had that little campaign that went viral for um for you know buying physical silver um to kind of oh yeah crash jp morgan buy yeah. silver exactly yeah, yeah. unfortunately and, i listen to max about silver not so much about bitcoin so uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know right that was my uh my achilles uh heel too as i um i didn't unload all my precious metals back then and, and go all in on on Bitcoin, but you know, Hey, Oh yeah. You know, I, I remember, uh, my wife still talks about, I wrote up a little thing. I'm like, Hey, I think I can get a free video card. If I just mine this thing called Bitcoin, I did like a little one sheet. I'm like, all right, uh -huh. this is much electricity. And, uh, she's like, no, you, you should not buy a $500 video card for this. This is ridiculous. Oh and, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think at that point, like Bitcoin crashed from like $30 down to like three or something. I was like, yeah. Oh man, good thing. I didn't do that. That would have been stupid. Yeah. So what a uh, dummy. <laughs> yeah. But I still got a box of silver laying around somewhere. So <laughs> it's, it's funny, an unfortunate I, uh, decision. It's funny. I, uh, it took me a long time. And then I finally, uh, when I was finally fully into the, um, in the, like the NFT, vintage nft like headspace and understanding and thesis i i dumped the last of my uh of my silver like i think it was last year to get like a lunar moon plots you know so <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm still waiting for uh for my last bit so uh w one of these days but it does make a good doorstop you know if you need one on yeah a windy day but oh, uh, cool. yeah, so uh, so then when I found out you could mine Ethereum with video cards, I kind of got into it and uh, had uh, like a little at home mining operation going for, I don't know, it's probably about two years before they finally shut that thing off. So uh, and that's how I got into NFTs was I had some Ethereum laying around and the only thing to buy with it was pictures. So it uh, led to the slippery path of buying way too many uh pepe nfts eventually no oh, that's awesome yeah what uh well so you uh you obviously you found your way back to from ethereum back to counterparty so <laughs> right yeah yep <laughs> I, I don't uh, know bitcoin I, has always been uh been the number one i don't know what you want to call it a cryptocurrency 
uh, or not, but like, you know, there's always Bitcoin and then everything else for me. So I do appreciate and use a lot of different things, but for me, it always comes back down to pricing, uh, all my crypto assets in Bitcoin and wanting more Bitcoin eventually. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. Um, yeah, well, that's interesting. Well, uh, um, I, <laughs> one of my funny, funny memories is I, um, uh, I mined a bunch of shit coins on video cards back in the day too. But, um, you know, one of the dumbest things I did is, um, I was chasing these privacy coins and stuff, but, um, I mined like when I first got like a 1080 and a 1080, my first cards I bought, um, I mined like Ethereum. I like traded it away at like $3 or $4 for you know, some shit. <laughs> oh, no. went to zero, you know? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> uh, God. Yeah, if I only knew which things to hold. I know, right? Well, um, yeah, what what were you mining with back then? Uh, so it was, uh, gosh, what did I first mine with? It was uh, 2060 was my first mining card. Okay. And then uh, when that started going like well, uh, yeah. because it really started cooking for a while, um, I just picked up a whole bunch of uh, 3000 series cards when they came out. So I had oh, yeah. uh, two racks of like 3060s, 3070s. And oh, cool. uh, yeah, kept the house nice and warm during the winter for a couple winters. So it was uh, it was fun. Yeah, you know, I um, it definitely like forces you to keep your like your eye on the on the crypto scene in terms of like what's going on, because you're always looking for what's profitable to mine and what like the new coins coming out are. So, yeah, it's, I don't know. It, it definitely forces you to focus on the, uh, on the scene, you know? Yeah. Well, it really got me back into it, you know, cause there was a couple of years in between where I hadn't really paid that much attention to crypto and uh, I just learn better when I'm actually doing something. So it was kind of a nice, like, uh, I don't know, gateway back into the scene. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, I I think so too. I kind of like you. Um, there's there were years where I I would only like every now and then like read read the news every a little bit, and there were times where you you know geek out and you try and try and get an understanding of all the major coins, you know, in the top 100 or top 200. So, you uh -huh. know, but that that became like pretty much impossible later on. But um, how did you find out about the about Counterparty after you were involved in the F scene? Well, so my first uh, NFT that I ever bought was a frog NFT. And gosh, I wonder, I don't even know what the project was called anymore. I'm pretty sure it went to zero. Was it like that and, Lonely Frogs Lambo Club or something? No, you know what? Let me, let me see. It's probably on here somewhere. Oh, I've bought way too many NFTs at this point. Yeah. I'm never going to see it. Uh, I don't know, but it was just some frog profile picture. It cost me like $400 mm -hmm. and uh, I thought it was like the craziest thing I'd ever done. And uh, I think uh board ape at the time was like one ETH and that's what had oh. like got my attention. I'm like, Oh, I can't believe someone's spending like $2,000 on these things. This is crazy. So I bought a frog one and started looking around and uh, my uh, mother-in-law uh, who, you know, got super into Pepe's at that time. And so I was talking to her about it. And uh, the idea of uh, NFT on Bitcoin, I thought was just the greatest idea ever. Cause in my mind, I love Bitcoin. I think it's gonna be around forever. So if I could have an asset on that or Ethereum, like Bitcoin would be my obvious choice. And I also thought there wasn't quite as much uh, attention at the time on Bitcoin NFTs as there was on Ethereum NFTs. So I thought I was uh, a little ahead of the curve maybe. And then once I started getting into rare Pepe's, that was the the beginning of the end. It, it really is. Like once, uh, I know for me, once I, once I started like really getting into that, it, uh, I don't know, it really takes hold. It's hard, to, it's hard to go back. Oh yeah. And this was right before uh, Pepe uh, WTF came out. Uh -huh. And so you really had to crawl around looking at cards like it was slow. Yeah. And uh, but man, I just spent hours going through those uh, rares. I mean, right. And it was uh, I think fake rares. It was right before fake rares started. Yeah. So like there was just rares and I looked at every single one of them. 
Yeah, I remember spending like hours going, like just using the free wallet to go through the listings mm -hmm. too and trying to find uh, like the cheapest, not crazy high supply cards that you could, you know, pick up off the decks, you know? That was good. Oh, time. yeah. Well, and just trying to figure out like how to use the decks. <laughs> I mean, just all of it is, uh, yeah, it was uh, quite the learning curve. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a lot of fun. I, uh, collecting, collecting rares and fake rares and fake commons and all that stuff is a dang, it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, so what, uh, what prompted you to, to decide to, uh, like go ahead and jump in and create your own cards? Um, you know, I really just wanted to leave a mark. Like I look at it a little bit as, uh, kind of just tagging something with graffiti on the back of a building. Like there's mm -hmm. like no greater digital asset than Bitcoin. If you listen to like Michael Saylor, right? Yeah. Like there is <laughs> there no is other no one. <laughs> there is no, there is no second best. So like, uh, for me, it's like my way of just kind of like etching my name on like, you know, the little thing in the, on the back wall. So just kind of wanted to like say something and like leave something. Well, it's cool. You're um, the, you've got two cards so far and um, you know, I thought your first one was really catching, but, and we'll, we'll talk about your cards, but your second one I thought was really interesting too, because you caught like, you caught really an interesting like moment in, uh, in American history too. the, the whole, dark Brandon moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what? As soon as I saw that, the first thing I thought was like, oh man, that's a Pepe. Like it has to be a Pepe. And I think it's because uh, I really appreciate the uh, cards that, I don't know, point to like a historical moment, whether it's kind of like American history or Bitcoin history, but it's just kind of like a nice little bookmark, like this happened. And uh, for me, the thought of like Pepe standing at that podium and uh, with his little like Pepe henchman foot soldiers behind him, it was just, it had to be done. Yeah, I, I thought it was so catching too, because, um, you know, it, it's uh, the way you, the way you captured it is um, uh, kind of like is making it a little bit more lighthearted than, because I mean, to be perfectly fair, it's, um, um, you know, that, this ominous times in terms of like what's happened to government and politics and in, in the United States, you know, and um, to make kind of an overt like act of, of power like that was um, something to take note of, you know, or at least I, I thought so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. But then I also think of like, well, yeah, but what if it was a dude in a Pepe mask, just yelling and screaming exactly. about that stuff? Because like, we're all just, you know, basically monkeys one way or another. Right. So just the idea of anybody doing that to me is just kind of funny in a way. Yeah. And your, your first card was, uh, was warning Pepe. What was your inspiration um, for that? Um, what well, was kind of uh two, twofold is one i was a hundred percent sure that the market was going to just nosedive <laughs> coming up and uh so i wanted to call it warning pepe because like the beginning is near it was kind of like the beginning of the end is near yeah um but then it was also uh you know my first one so it was my beginning mm -hmm. and uh i also really be believe that like even though we were about to go through you know, a harder time, like everybody kind of knew like a bear market was on the way. Um, or at least, you know, people were talking about it in general. Uh, it still is like the beginning of the whole thing. And I think it's, uh, I don't know, for the first thing that I had to kind of like put out there, I wanted it to be kind of like a positive sentiment. Cause I do think like, this is the beginning, even if times get tough, like this is still the beginning. It's still pretty rad to be here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I thought it turned out really well. Um, you know, and it, it goes well with the the your the other one we were just discussing, Dark Winter, which again I I, I, let, I do uh it's really striking too how you captured that and again made it kind of like meme on it too, made it light lighthearted. Yeah. Well it's kind of like uh 
some of my favorite rare Pepe's did that, you know, it's like the, even like the original Trump Pepe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like taking China political Pepe figures. Too. Yeah. Just, you know, it, it kind of like, uh, is it weird that it like humanizes them, even though you're like dehumanizing them? I'm not exactly sure how that works, but like, there's something fun about the whole thing. Yeah, for sure. What was your experience like, um, like uh, creating arts for the first time? It was actually way easier than I thought it was going to be. It was a little bit of a wait at the time because the fake comments had just kind of like opened up. I think I, I got in at season three three i think yeah so mm -hmm. like i put in kind of like right at the start of season one so it was a little bit uh like busy but once i heard it was super smooth and uh i would have never made a card if it wasn't for carcinated because mm -hmm. i think he put out a tweet saying something about like oh everybody can make art and like i'd never thought about making art or like you know of myself as an artist before um so i'm like well what if you do if you can't and he's like well no you just do it anyways and so I'm like, all right, <laughs> okay. that's awesome. I'm going to make a card, you know? And I thought like, what am I going to do? And actually there's a, a cow in the background of my, my warning Pepe. Oh, I see and, that. Yeah. Uh, that's a carcinated uh, cow that he does his uh, morning moo mm -hmm. uh, series about. So that was him in, in the background, like, you know, pushing me to do it. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. He's put out some really cool cards too we were talking offline about some of his cards and um uh especially like uh, one i thought was really amazing that he that he captured was the um that rider rips one. and you know there's fake wyoming and all that but i thought the rider rips one um was a really a, a an amazing part of uh of fake rares i mean it's one of the only cards where you had to the only like he didn't even make any money off that he um like it was, you burn a, uh, you burn a, uh, a rider rip uh, board ape yacht club, and you burn a fake ASF in order to redeem for one of those twenty one of those cards. So, uh, a really, uh, really cool card. Yeah, I love how Carcinated does like basically scavenger hunts for his cards, mm -hmm. and uh, just like. Uh kind of like learning about uh writer rips through that whole experience and then like like i follow him now on twitter and like watching like i don't know him and his story and how he was being sued by board apes and all this stuff happening like i don't know it's just a a great use of like art for something else like i love how carcinated always has something else that he's trying to teach you along with yeah. like getting the card it's almost like passing a class you know I can't wait yeah. to get hit one of his uh, fake Wyoming's. So that's still on my trip list for this summer. So fingers crossed. Me too. I, I don't own one of those yet. And I, I eventually hope to add that to my collection too. I, um, yeah, to your point too, I, um, I thought it was also interesting going through that process to claim that I learned that um, like essentially almost like uh, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but like um, because of that lawsuit, like uh, they, you can't even trade the those rider rip on most of the big platforms. I think I had to go through like even even looks rare. I think I had to use like um like Jim or something like that in order to actually buy the buy the ones that I burned. So you know. <laughs> oh yeah, it's crazy. Well, and that's uh you know one of the things I like about crypto is just learning how to do new stuff. Yeah. And just getting that card, like trying to figure out how to buy one of those board apes of his and then burn it and the contract and the the whole thing was <laughs> like i couldn't redo it right now uh, yeah but you know it's fun it's like a, an adventure in a way i also like that it that kind of it um uh, it's kind of come back to that rider rips uh episode with and that uh, during the crypto bull because i thought it was an amazing use of narrative in order to pump something like you can look at it from a couple different angles but like one is that he's basically making it performance arts basically showing how you know you're selling tokens not actually the artwork because the tokens are what point to the art type of thing now right. I, I get that but I, but um you know there are people that were pushing this narrative of what you know board apes are racist or yuga's yuga labs is uh, racist and like 
like in order to like ship like give it to the man you're you got to buy these um buy these uh rider rip uh, board API <laughs> clubs and you had all these guys that were literally just lining up giving rider rips uh what was it point what was it point one or point one five times uh ten thousand so he made like what fifteen hundred um uh f off that deal i mean <laughs> jesus <Jeez. laughs> you gotta you gotta respect the hustle on that to, to convince you got people to. That to convince i have such people. a hard time scraping a couple eth together like yeah. these guys that can put any of these projects together and get that hype is just like i can't even imagine how brilliant is it is that you convince these people that they're sticking it to the man by giving you 1500 f <laughs> oh i don't know i just saw uh Polly on twitter mm -hmm. he had like uh like send send me eth to like i will give you nothing or something yeah. like that I'm like yeah. hey you know it's crypto so you don't know <laughs> you send ETH to anything <laughs> yeah exactly i mean you know, um, I mean, hey, when when you got ETH, it's uh, I'll tell you what, it doesn't stay in my wallet long, and it's ended up in probably some worse projects than fake board apes. <laughs> yeah, you know, and the, I kind of want to go back and buy one just for the, because uh, I I burned the the couple that I got, but um, um, just to have one for my collection, just to to uh, you know, as a memento from that whole episode. But yeah, that's yeah, was... funny. I've thought about the same thing actually. You know, there's actually, a, I was, re, I, you know, I don't follow his case closely, but uh, I think I read a blurb that, you know, one of the things that I think they were trying to get him to do potentially is basically to, to burn all of the, all of the NFTs, which is impossible. Like not everyone's going to list. And um, even if he was trying to buy them back, but I don't know. So, you know, yeah, suddenly lot... they'd be worth infinity dollars, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> You know that could be like the first NFT where there's like a court a uh, court order for for a buyback where you know I don't know just weird yeah stuff. like a court ordered buyback like yeah. oh, you better not be caught with one of them fake board apes and well, that's where the, some of this gets so like ludicrous and kind of like a funny way when it comes to thinking about any of this as like in the same kind of thought as like regular property you know like we're obviously dealing with some different stuff here. Mm -hmm. Um, but like watching them keep trying to apply like old laws and just kind of like thoughts to it is it's ridiculous. Cause like you said, like it is the token, the token is the art, right? Mm -hmm. So like pointing to somebody else's art, like, ah, and then you try to make somebody destroy it. Like, well, you can't. So what are we going to do? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's why I think, um, you know, and, and you know, while we're talking on the subject, Yuga has been sending out cease and desist or take up notices for some of these eth inscription punk projects, um, which I also think is, is hilarious in the sense that um, I've been saying this for, for over a year, a year or two, is that, I, I mean, I think we're going to, very soon we're going to see, see crypto is going to expose the futility of IP laws as exercised today, because anyone can, who knows what they're doing, they can like, they can get some washed eth, or they can buy some clean eth from an, an, a non-exchange and they can like use Tor or something, deploy deploy a website and contracts that are completely anonymous that, that are using all these copyrighted things. And there's no one to send the cease and desist to, you know, like go pound sand, Yuga, right? So Right. Yeah. Well, and that's where we really get into some some interesting uh like yeah. copyright areas. Right. Yeah, because what and, are you going to sue? You know, the you copyright sue. system has been pretty gamed for a long time, so it definitely yeah. could use a little disruption. Yeah, exactly. What are they going to do? Sue the Ethereum network? You know, like <laughs> right. Well, that's where some of this it just gets so ridiculous. And since yeah. it's so decentralized and you can't shut it down, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? I guess you know the thing with Ethereum, like you never know. They might be able to just take it out of there, but not those Bitcoin inscriptions. Good <laughs> luck with those. Exactly. Yeah, and um, you know, speaking of like, what's your, like, um, I think the ordinal inscriptions are really cool, um, but we've also seen recently the the rise of these Bitcoin stamps. What are what are your thoughts on the the stamp scene? You know, I'm for any innovation that comes with this stuff, whether it's the ordinals or the stamps or anything they can like devise to put any use to Bitcoin. Like I'm all for and just letting the market decide. So I don't really know like the technical differences between the two, 
but uh, I just like seeing any innovation come out. Yeah, you know, I I think yeah, I'm, I think it's it's cool. Um, I think it's to me like one of the things that it's it's crazy in retrospect is that there's so little use of Bitcoin for its original intended purpose that we can really, we can affordably inscribe you know JPEGs on the on the like the Bitcoin blockchain, <laughs> like the most secure decentralized network in human history. Like for for fifty bucks, I can inscribe something. Like okay, you know what? Why not? It really is crazy if you think yeah. about it, and especially something that like you know is going to go on for a long, long, long time. Like where in history have you been able to do something like that? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and we put silly pictures. That's what we choose to put on there. <laughs> 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 you get to say something for $50 that may last like multiple generations. Yeah. You know, but I mean, there's, there's punks something... with orange backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Everything has to have a punk. The first thing, like, okay, guys, it's, I, I get it, but can't can't we do something else? Yeah. Um, uh. You know, I, there are some legit applications that I before inscriptions and stamps and the, these types of things I always thought would be um, one of the most valuable uses of blockchain in the real world would be um, embedding um, like small files, like like patent applications um things that are that you need to prove the um you know the authenticity but also distribute like for sensitive patent applications or sensitive technology that you want to give away to the world like mm -hmm. um we have a weird system in the u.s where um like some people they can basically have their patent seized by the government if it's is quote unquote sensitive or if like whatever so you know you can like there's people that can be put in a position where they can't even talk about their own their own work or their own invention right so um that's kind of an, an interesting like workaround in the sense for hey if you're going to apply for a patent you know why don't you why don't you publish it on the blockchain as well and if they try and censor you it's you know good luck taking down bitcoin right yeah well i think it's uh it amazes me a little bit that it's not already being used for that. Yeah. Yeah. It seems, it seems so, it seems like, you know, a great use case for it, especially when like the, the cost to do small files is like, again, it's, it's incredibly cheap when you think about, yeah, again, it's just incredible that, that the blocks already aren't filled with transactions of just normal stuff. So I think it's also good just to, you know, drive more, drive more fees for, you know, drive up the usage while there's still block space, you know, unused essentially. Right. Yeah. Well, and I mean, sometimes I still think of Bitcoin as like, uh, like it's most basic form as like just a regular blockchain. It's like a decentralized spreadsheet. Right. So like whatever yeah. you put in that cell is going to be there forever. Like it's really, I don't know. I think it's going to end up being a lot bigger use case later on. And also why things like AI are going to be so hard to stop because you can just take any kind of code from anything, throw it on the Bitcoin blockchain and it's there forever. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, the idea of censoring code or anything at this point becomes like a lot more difficult too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, we're interesting times, you know, we, we've seen the first state attempted takedown of, essentially code with the um tornado cache thing so um i don't know it's going to be interesting to see how to see how this plays out for sure yeah have you paid attention at all to that oh, man i'm probably going to get it wrong it's like operation like lockstep or yeah where something they've been like that to... where they're trying to shut down all the crypto exchanges or stop uh stop yeah. the flow of money in basically yeah yeah they're trying to take take away all the fiat uh on and off ramps essentially yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, not unexpected, right. At some point they're going to fight you, but at the same time, uh, I think Larry Fink just came out this week and, uh, was saying all kinds of good things about Bitcoin. So at the same time that they're fighting, like they're saying good things now. So yeah, I it's, mean, uh, it's interesting because what are they going to do? How are you going to stop it? Really? 
Oh, well, you know, and, and this is also the same, I think it was this week or last week where, you know, like one of these uh, esoteric broker licenses or something to be like, to play by the rules that even Coinbase wasn't able to get like the, um, our government just gave like the only license for crypto as a special broker license to this, like this crony, uh, like this thing was hooked up to the Democrats in this corruption scheme that even has ties to the, like the CCP or something like paradigm or something like that. I mean, it's, it's just exposing how, how corrupt and insidious the, the, um, the whole scene is, uh, you know, with the government and and their manipulation. You know, at the same time too, we also just recently had, you know, one of the one of the oldest uh, operating shitcoin exchanges in the U.S. Like they stopped serving U.S. customers Bitrix. They shut down all mm. their operations this year too. So yeah, yeah, just less and less options, which is crazy in like a growing market, right? That you'd have that. Yeah, and I really, mean, to me, like I understand. Like I'm surprised the government doesn't fight harder. And I'm surprised that they haven't started this earlier because to me, they're just so far behind now that I don't know what they can do besides maybe co-opt it. I think, well, well, they've already co-opted co Bitcoin in my, in my view. I mean, that I know some people get really butthurt when you say that, but in terms of like the, the control of development and like with core, that's, that's been centralized and controlled for years. I mean, that's, um, but uh, but what I think is going on too, like a lot of people are really excited about these these announcements of like BlackRock and all these other companies getting ETFs approved. I actually think this is probably the uh, one of the ways that they're like pivoting to try and, and control it. Like they they realize that these other other efforts aren't gonna aren't gonna cut it. So. Uh, I suspect that they're going to use these ETFs and, and these other products in order to basically inflate the supply of Bitcoin through these paper synthetics, right? So, oh, that's um, such a such a strange theory. It's like they've almost done that before in other commodities, <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Did you ever watch that? Um, did you ever catch that clip? It went viral online on like Zero Hedge or whatnot. But um, of back uh, when I think it was was it Bob Pisani or one of those CNBC anchors went to. Um, to like to have a little dog and pony show in the uh, GLD ETFs vault, and uh, lo and behold, he actually picked up a bar and exposed the serial number to the uh, to the camera, and you know of course some some anons went down to track down the serial number and found out that it, it didn't actually belong to to GLD at least on paper. So there's <laughs> you know <laughs> I do remember that happening. I absolutely yeah. remember that happening, and uh, yeah, it's a it's amazing. Uh... Like, I mean, you know, having been through the silver and gold thing before, that was kind of like yeah. one of my main rabbit holes, like that got me here back in the day is uh, the way that they're able to manipulate things like that, even though it's like, you know, gold is seen as like this big thing. It's yeah. just wild. It is wild what a shell game it is. Did you ever, uh, do you ever read about GATA? Oh yeah. The gold and Yeah. Yeah. When I went reading their documentation and, um, you know, like you said, like the rabbit hole goes real deep on that. And when you realize that, um, when you realize it's really the central banks and, and the global banks against everyone else and all these, all these mega banks are just doing the bidding of the central banks in order to, again, protect fiat, right? So yep. I, I, sus I suspect that they've got some sort of similar... Um, similar deal too with um with these financial instruments you know uh I'm, well i'm sure you're aware too back back in the um back in that bull market for gold and silver before they 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 crushed it with the fake obama news uh or osama bin laden news um you know you know when they crushed silver that weekend i was trade oh, i was actually yes i was actually trading <laughs> i remember silver. that weekend <laughs> I was trading silver leveraged on uh forex so i very vividly remember that shit <laughs> uh, yeah. but uh um you know i i suspect that they're going to use this in order to um in order to give them the the ability to uh or, or or what i was remembering is that there are a lot of very credible rumors back then that if you went to exercise like buy uh futures on the uh, on the market that and you tried to, to redeem them that essentially you you'd be offered 
more than face value in order to take take a paper settlement. So mm -hmm. that's another aspect where, like with the futures, they can also use that potentially to inflate the supply of Bitcoin as well, not just the ETFs, but even with the futures too. So oh, absolutely. Like once they start like financializing like the the asset, like the more they do it, the more back doors it gives them to do things and like yeah. that is the one promise of bitcoin is like that there is the fixed supply right and that you can tell on chain what's going on so it will be interesting to see what they can do and if all of their old tricks work because you know i would think in a free market that if you're going to have a etf that the price of bitcoin would go up right because just more right. people have an easier way to buy it Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could, but you could also, you know, again, you could also like look at the other way is that, you know, they supposedly have, have, um, have this easy, because it's an easier way to own it, that is taking, taking all of the organic on-chain uh, buy pressure away from them. So again, allowing them to play these games and rehypothecate and, you know, do banker games, right? So yep, play banker games. That is that's a great way of putting it. <laughs> and boy, they have a thick playbook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, but you know, uh, this is why we need Bitcoin. And like I really yeah. am one of those people that's like, Bitcoin fixes this, like uh us letting the government control money and what money is was probably the biggest mistake that we've made in our country's history. Well, so, it wasn't I mean, I mean you're you're aware of it, but we didn't allow them to do it again. They, they used subterfuge and by hook and crook they took it. They did. This wasn't a. This wasn't something that even like, I'm sure even our politicians back then weren't the best, but they were better than what we've got today. And they didn't want to allow that. They they snuck it in, and that has been, you know, again that one of the downfalls of of you know, taking taking the U.S. down the wrong path is is. Um, yeah, handing over control of currency to private central banks. I, people still don't get like how mind blowing having like these private banks, privately owned banks, um, you know, have allow them to not just control the issuance of money, but like the like set interest rates and like how insane all of this stuff is. Oh yeah, because you don't have to be that intelligent. If they gave you a magic money printer that you got to put in your basement it would not take you a very long time to own the world. Like it just wouldn't. Yeah. You know? And like, I'm, I'm not any smarter than the average guy out there, <laughs> but I could do it. So yeah. these guys, they got it down. You know, there's a famous quote, I think it was by HL Mencken. It was something like, um, like no matter how, uh, how cynical you get is never enough. And, and I, <laughs> I think that applies really well to, to banking in the sense that, um, you know, it's it truly is uh, like one of the most heinous and viciously corrupt, dehumanizing, and and destructive forces on the planet today. And the the most one of the most pernicious things is how few people understand that, right? So, right, because uh, one of the things that makes it so nefarious is it's so hard to see. Yeah. And I only went, I, I figured all this stuff out. I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of credit to Ron Paul, cause he just wouldn't shut up about it on YouTube. So like, you know, that was definitely half the battle, but yeah. I was just getting out of school and I'm like, okay, now I got to go make money. Like, I don't even know where money comes from. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, a couple, a couple books later. <laughs> Suddenly you know, I'm reading like Creature from Jekyll Island and like, oh boy, it's just all downhill from there. Well, you know, they hide behind all this artificial complexity, but at the end of the day, like the the analogy that that like really hit home for me, like explain to people is like literally we're spending our lives like working, toiling, hustling for clown bots that they're, like you said, literally printing out of their HP laser jet. And they can print themselves as many as they want, and they've never been audited. Like, and and they're getting paid for the privilege, and that like they get they own the bank, and they're getting dividends. And like, are you are you serious? I mean, plus the <laughs> the history of the, um, I mean, the history of like the uh, 
the the drug drug cartel with uh, you know like how HSBC was formed with the opium like strictly to launder money from the uh, opium wars. I mean these oh, the, these banks yeah. are born in in I you know I don't don't mean this in a religious way, but born in sin, right? You know they are <laughs> well. Yeah. Isn't it the Virgin Islands is trying to bring suit against JP Morgan for like Epstein financing? I mean, like they're yeah, in yeah. everything. Like it's, yeah. it is a shady business, which is crazy. You would think like, I mean, I know growing up, like I never thought of bankers as like shady yeah. people. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, it ends up the, the banking complex is, is quite the monster. But like you, I, I think that, um, you know, we have we have a lot of fun and we we meme and we play games on the um um but I do think that you know cryptocurrency uh has a like a higher purpose in the sense that it's it's the technology that's going to give us a path out of this because um it allows us to build this these um these voluntary systems that we can choose to adopt and like move move out of this corrupt rig system. I mean um, I mean, it's very clear that they, through actions and, and history, that they're not going to give away control of essentially the lives of everyone in their in the countries that use their fiat willingly, right? I mean, this is the highest stakes game there is, right? Oh, a hundred percent. And I really think that when you get down to it, it is the game. It right? is. Everything else is built on money. You know, I another article I like to send people because who don't like who haven't done like the reading that we have um on like the monetary aspects is but that really highlights the how pernicious like people like i think like people's sense of justice has been weaponized and they're they're being sent in these and these they're basically being made to be useful idiots by chasing down these things that are superfluous and don't matter like when they're like to purposely keep them from looking at the bigger picture. So there's this article written by Alex Gladstein. It was like um, uh, breaking, like uh, breaking uh, the chains of uh, of colonization with Bitcoin w with open source money, and it's talking about mm. how up to this day how France is uh, is basically using its monetary system in a in a colonial fashion to keep uh, to keep oppressed. And to rob all of these African nations to this day, it's really sickening. I mean, and again, oh, right, yeah, I uh, I've totally forgotten about that story. But at one point, I was aware. Like, it's crazy how uh, France uses their currency as a weapon oh, against yeah. and, uh, like countries in Africa. Uh huh. And and to and to have these countries pretend to have any sort of moral high ground, you know, in any affairs when they're still like robbing from the poorest people. And on earth you know it's um anyway i mean the, go down oh, yeah. hole on that but i um, know right i mean and then you just <laughs> throw, throw all the inflation on top of that which you know hurts poor people more than anybody else and it's just like you know i i really think that bitcoin gives you the hope where you can kind of have the thoughts of like what if what if all yeah. of that was gone replaced by this like how good how much better would the world be yeah i mean Imagine, imagine countries where, you know, especially, well, imagine all these Western countries where they didn't have the option of printing money to, to play these, um, play the colonialism game and these war games and, and control games. And they're not doing these wars for our benefit, you know? So, I mean, that's very clear. So no, yeah, we, to, we to, waste a lot of resources, killing a lot of people, not for our benefit. It ends up. But, well, you know, at the, at the same time, like we're at a really interesting crossroads in history because the other day, well, I guess yesterday, uh, I'm listening to Jack Mahler's talk to Jack Dorsey. And in the mm -hmm. first, like, I don't know, 15 minutes of their conversation, Jack Dorsey's just popping off about the CIA killing JFK. And no I, I was thinking, I'm like, you know, like Jack Dorsey's like a big deal. You yeah. know, like we are in such a strange time right now. And I'm sure like Elon would probably pop off about the same stuff, right? To where like, it feels like the future is up in the air. And yeah. I haven't felt like that before. And I don't think that it's that common of like an occurrence that happens. I agree. I mean, I, um, um, 
you know, it, it's funny as a as a as a kid, I remember reading about um Russia and um and the system and kind of like the 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 joke about um the pad about reading Pravda and laughing and and um you know finding it humorous and then the joke being that uh, it's not it's not what you read it's how you read it right because they mm. like they knew it was all propaganda and and, and crap back then right and to right. see the humor in it and I never thought uh, back then at least so quickly we would see the same thing in our country too and like you're saying to see cracks in that with these powerful figures it yeah it like things are you can feel that things are shifting. Um, you know, it's it's definitely interesting times. Um, yeah, I, I I mean, and even even the the small things like um, uh, what was it Venezuela that uh, was it Venezuela that adopted uh, Bitcoin as official? Um, uh, El Salvador. El, El Salvador. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's just. I mean, you know, in game theory, it only takes one to to change the change the game for everyone else, right? Yep. So, uh, you know, and ironically, well, I mean, yeah, just that first domino, right? That first domino yeah. has to get pushed over. You know, and it's so funny that um, while while countries like that, you remember how they were getting like finger wagged and, and threatened by by the World Bank and all these other institutions to not do it, but at the same time, we have um, the U.S. has the has like the remainder of those Silk Road coins that they they got uh, stole from someone recently that they're going to sell off. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> to sell off like one of the only, if only things. the U S government would have just kept all the Bitcoins they stole over the years. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> yeah. They'd have a nice little sack. Yeah, they would. But, um, well, this has been, been uh, a fun chat, but well, let's, uh, let's kind of shift over to, um, you know, one, one thing, I was really curious to talk about, and we we chatted a little bit before about this. Is, um, you know, you've really like, well, I I, I guess step back a little bit. So back in twenty, like the twenty twenty one, twenty twenty ish, twenty twenty two ish, there's kind of like this this common idea that, and I I believed it too. Um, you know, based on seeing like Decentraland and stuff like that, that we would see, um, kind of and uh, kind of like a, a centralized metaverse emerge that people would all get into the same the same metaverse and then you know people were applying the same kind of thought patterns about land and land scarcity and assets in that model um but from talking to you it really really flipped the lid and and uh you know you're able to give me an idea of, of what's actually happening today like where the usage is and you know which can help us kind of see uh to see where things are going in the future and how that that can how that's probably going to uh, morph and shift going forward. So I thought I'd. Uh, uh, why don't you just tell me where, like how you, like how you decided to to jump into VR and what was your first VR headset and how did you decide to, to take on this product? Uh, well, I've always been interested in VR, especially as like a concept. Like I remember when I was little, trying out like the Nintendo VR thing that had like the red lines as their display. Oh no screen. way, the Game Boy VR thing. Yeah, the... yeah, it was a uh, oh, what's Virtua Boy maybe something yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I never like, knew anyone, you know, one, but I I saw it. Yeah, I never knew anybody that owned one. I actually got to try one out at like a gaming a swap meet kind of thing one yeah. time. Um, and then, uh, I was actually, I was on a, a TV show. Uh, it was G4 arena. It was like a competitive video game. I don't know, like clan versus clan kind of thing on G4 TV, uh -huh. but they had the, the big like army VR things. Uh -huh. And so that was in, I think 2000 and like two or something. So I got like try out like the big army, like simulation pods. I think we were playing America's army, like is uh, like the original ones, like a long. Oh yeah. Ago. I remember that. And uh, so it's always been on my radar. And so I actually got off of, um, Oh, what was the site? They had the first Oculus where you like pre-ordered it. Uh -huh. Um, go fund me, go fund okay. me. Kickstarter is Kickstarter. Gosh, it's so long ago now. It's uh crazy. Um, but I got one of those on Kickstarter and it was awful, but like as a tech demo, it was fantastic. And, uh, so kind of at that point I knew I was all in, but I had to wait for like 
the right hardware to show up. Um, and so when Valve announced their index, I pre-ordered it and got it way later because uh, it took them so long. But ever since then, I've been uh, kind of like a VR enthusiast, I'd say. I play a lot of the major games. I've uh, kind of checked out most of the things there is to check out at this point. And uh, yeah, which isn't like that common. Uh, a lot of people uh, try VR and a lot of their first experiences, uh, the Quest, like the Quest one that Meta made, or I guess Facebook at the time. And I've heard that the average usage of those things is one time. Like the average person use it, use the Quest one, one time and the Quest two, two times. And so I think that everybody kind of looks at VR right now through that lens. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just kind of, I don't know, not really the cutting edge of what's going on. And it's like you're using Facebook and trying to judge the internet or like using AOL back in the day yeah. and trying to like look outside the, the walled garden and figure out what's going on. Well, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I started out with the OG Oculus Rift, the commercial version, not the dev kit one like you got, but I got the first, um, the first first commercial version of that. And, um, you know, my, I didn't use it a lot because, you know, you know, the, it, for a couple of reasons, like one, the, having come from a, like a, a gaming background and like an FPS background, like I, I'm pretty sensitive to like the display technologies and like the, the screen door effect on those early displays was really bad. Like it just, but for me, I, what even like, and there's some technical issues too, but, but what I, what I did, I, I don't regret buying it because for me, it, it gave me the experience through, through playing with it a little bit to, to like see firsthand and experience firsthand it is going to be the future. I could, you can see that. It's just not, we just don't have that tech ready, like to the level it needs to be. But like, oh, I, I just, you know, you can, it's palpable, you know? Yeah, it's very close. And when you have like really good hardware for a computer and you're using kind of the latest, greatest headsets, I mean, it is getting to that point where it's just good. It's just not accessible yet. So I think we've kind of reached a lot of those milestones on what's possible. Now it's just mm -hmm. waiting for it for like, I mean, it might be even like Apple, right? Cause what do we need? We need a really good UI and that's super usable, some killer apps that'll hook some people and uh, it's going to just take off. It's going to go crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting that, um, yeah, I'm not sure how it'll play out, but you know, uh, we're going to have to get we're going to have to get it to where like it's simpler to where people don't have to have like the absolute like most cutting edge pc to play at at the frame rates necessary in order to you know to drive these things properly for these games and whatnot so i mean again like I, we had kind of an underwhelming uh generation refresh from both nvidia and amd maybe the next one is going to be more of a, a you know a big advancement in the and the capability so maybe that'll help but, uh, yeah and really the uh i mean the tech's always getting smaller right so mm -hmm. even you look at the apple uh just announced their headset and the amount of computing power that they can fit in that thing that looks like snowboard goggles now is wild compared to 10 years ago you know and fortunately we live in a time where those things are just going to continue barring something ridiculous happening so you're just going to be able to take right, what are like a 3090 and i don't know 12 gigs of ram 16 gigs of ram and have it strapped on your head in just a couple years <laughs> you know i was thinking about this uh, earlier this week is that i was thinking back to one of the like one of the pcs i built back in the day you know back in like the windows 2000 era or something where somewhere around there where you know i was thinking back i think that was like what 120 megabytes of ram and nowadays you can get um graphics cards that have 24 gigabytes of ram you know so, yeah. so it's like like things of you know that's and it's not that long ago right so um yeah i think you know yeah things are just going to keep getting smaller and and faster and, and better but um 
but yeah, yeah so I, I played the original doom off of a floppy disk is that oh, 3.5 yeah. megabytes i mean like oh me too it's crazy <laughs> like when you really think about it like the the change in the uh like a span of a lifetime is just wild yeah i played the original wolfenstein and the original doom and you know a bunch of those like first gen shooters back in the day and um you know it is it is really crazy to look back and you know like hey i didn't get involved in punch cards or anything like that but just in our lifetime to go from you know dial-up modems and you know 286s and 386s and pentiums to to what we got today is is pretty incredible i mean to where oh, yeah even, i mean even our smartphones just are you know incomparable right uh, to to that early stuff so but yeah, yeah I, well and i think we just have a hard time even though we've been through that still projecting that forward in like a realistic way because yeah. since we're like living on an exponential curve it took a long time to get those first like or i guess like you know when the technology doubled in uh speed but halved in size mm -hmm. like it went from the size of a room to the size of half a room it's like ah, it's still not that good but like we're to the point now where it's so small and it's so fast that every time it gets faster like it's just it's starting to be like magic yeah i mean it, yeah especially with a lot of these um you know we have enough compute and, and some of the like with throwing in some of these novel ai stuff where now we have real time effects like the like you know people that are using things like you know tiktok effects and whatnot where like people it's, it's the stuff of of science fiction 20 years ago you couldn't imagine like as you're recording something um you know manipulating and adding effects in in real time i mean you know it's it's crazy what people can do that we take for granted now oh it's insane there was a i think it was an nvidia conference where the presenter recorded herself with her phone and then like uh, saying like a little speech handed it over to like this person on stage that has a computer and in like one minute, she was turned into a character in Unreal Engine, like giving the speech. And it's <laughs> like that stuff took like definitely like six months, if not like a year to do like just a little bit ago. Now it's just like it's done. It's crazy. Or like you're saying with the filters, like it's mm -hmm. wild. Or uh, right now, AI is just like mind blowing because I don't know. I kind of use elections as landmarks. Last yeah. election, the words AI weren't thrown out at all. <laughs> now it's yeah. like half my day is spent thinking about what's going on in AI at the moment. Yeah, you know, and I, I like the term you use because I think about it in this way too, is that I, I view that human innovation is on like a J curve. It is pretty exponential. And that's where I think a lot of people um, like, you know, one of the things I, I I worry about, one of the only things I really worry about Bitcoin staying live long term, is the the encryption that they're using. You know, it's not resilient against um, quantum computers. So um, I think I think to this day people are really discounting the the potential for for the uh, you know, how quickly that, that can advance. So um, you know, so that's something I, I'm I'm looking out for too. But um, do you not I, I, uh, think that the uh, community would respond well in that kind of situation? Like, well, how, how would you see that like going down? Because I would think that like, you know, couldn't something be patched even afterwards? Like we just go back, but like, you know, fix the encryption. Well, well, well no, actually it's, it's it, like, if we allow it to get to that point, it's truly catastrophic because what that means, what like the consequences of, of of these computers getting to that point, quantum computers, is uh, it it breaks the encryption that that secures the public private key pair, right? So, um, um, and and potentially, you know, even it's harder to do it too. But even off a signature, I think you you'd be able to, um, uh, uh, you'd be able to to crack right so so for example when you expend something in bitcoin like you're you're using your you know your signature to do that or and in some in some transactions you're you're using your exposing your um your public key um in order to, to um for the transaction 
So, um, and a lot of transactions where your public key is exposed, anyone with quantum computer at that point would be able to take all of the all of the funds. Period. So, like, there's no network if there's no security to to the to the balances, right? It just stops, right? And there's yeah. other consequences too, where theoretically, uh, you know, like people could could essentially, if again, if it gets powerful enough you'd be able to, as people are trying to submit transactions, like you'd be able to craft the encryption um, and then change the, um, you know, change the destination and, you know, submit that at a higher fee back into the mempool, still their funds too. So it's, it's, it truly is a fundamental attack on the very existence of Bitcoin that is not being even explored. I, I keep checking every now and then for BIPs um, to address that. It, the other problem is that, um, like people like this, a J curve. So what, seven years ago, there was like a one qubit machine and now we're, we're like in the hundreds of qubits. Yeah. It's crazy. Right? And, and yeah. I think it, I think we're talking about something in the neighborhood of like, what was it like 10,000 logical qubits or something that would be necessary to break? Uh, I think it's 10,000 ish. Maybe, maybe it's a hundred, but it's been a while since I've looked at it, but 10,000 ish. Let's say, or let's say 100 for, for argument's sake. Yeah, so since um, it's already gone 100 fold, if it went another 100 fold, we'd be in trouble. Kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it I, doesn't and the, really look like it's slowing down. Interesting. Right. Well, the, the way I put it, the way I look at it is that if you're discounting that possibility, you're essentially like making a bet against human innovation in that sense. We already had, um, there was a paper that was put out like a year and a half ago where um, some of the top researchers in the field, they they put like a um, a not insubstantial risk that by the end of the decade, I think they put it at something like a, you know, five to 15% chance that the, um, uh, the elliptic curve crypt cryptography would be broken by quantum computers. So um, like we have all these whales, like, you know, we're joking about Sailor and, and whatnot, like, you know, you know, there is no second best, you know, like he's all in on Bitcoin, but if like no one's doing the work to prepare for a scenario that would potentially end it as a technology, right? So the other problem too is that even if you have, so let's say that we've we've addressed this and we recognize this as a threat. So Bitcoin is the oldest network. Um, you know how ossified it is. So even if we we identified that we need to change like the, the implementation for, for one, you have to change the that way proof of work is done, right? That's a huge change because, you know, everything's an ASIC. So you've got like, what, I don't know, like a six month year lead time in order to modify ASICs and, and produce new generation to go out into the world and do that in a way that's fair without blah, blah, blah. So that's one thing. <laughs> right, yeah, not right. easy. But, but also here's the other thing is, is unless there's some crazy novel solution, you also need to have enough time. Like you have to implement a new signature scheme Right, and then you also have to have a window to allow people to send a, send their funds from the old signature scheme that's that's um, broken to the right. uh, that will be broken to the the secure signature scheme, and like how long do you give people to transfer their Bitcoin, right? Because you're you're going to be in a scenario where you're going to have to put a a a deadline, right? And you're going to break of the one of the fundamental assumptions of Bitcoin in the sense that. You can, like a lot of old timers, they they got their their uh, paper wallet or whatever, or their hardware wallet or their seed phrase. They toss it in the safety deposit box. They never even touch their, like it never even sees a computer anymore. They just they're able to see it online and know that they have it. If they don't follow the news, even if you give two three years to to migrate your assets, not everyone's going to know about it. There's going to be going to be people with huge balances, and even in it's just as tragic for small balances for people that, that saved up that much that just don't like aren't following the news that their their funds are just going to get slashed because they you know they don't they didn't know right so yeah uh, and it, yeah and it's it's complicated so that's that's my point is that um it, like just saying it's a problem isn't it, like this is a big problem like it's i mean what, what are we talking about three years four years for for like if even if they um realize it's a threat to, to go from yeah it's just like a blink of an eye yeah and, and you know and we've we've already seen um how quickly the the technology is advancing one of the things i the last thing i'll say on this is 
I, the other aspect that I think is even more fascinating is that, you know, people like, you know, a lot of people shit on how like quantum, the current state of quantum computing and how quickly they're advancing. Uh, but I mean, it is advancing very quickly. I, I don't think it's anything to laugh at, but the other approach too, that I think is also a little bit frightening is that you can use uh, modern, uh, modern traditional computers with like, uh, including with GPUs in order to emulate like make virtual qubits, which are the virtual, you know, computing units of a quantum computer you simulate that um it just takes a lot of resources so that's another fear I, I have is that something you know you know someone at, at the level of a state act like the NSA would have the resources in order to um brute force you know by just throwing money at the problem and, and you know tying together a bunch of traditional systems too so mm -hmm. Well, so I have this uh, habit now is uh, yeah. when I realize that something might be really bad because, you know, when you start looking at stuff, it happens all the time. Yeah. So I, mm -hmm. I look for a silver lining. So uh, yeah. so when you were saying all that, I'm like, ah, fuck. And I'm like, all right, where's the silver lining if this starts to go this way? On the bright side, we're going to be super early in to Bitcoin yeah. too, right? We'll yeah, be true. Bitcoin two whales. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. I mean, I, once I think, they solve that problem, I'm all in like all over again. The narrative will be great. You know, and, and there's, there's like, you know, there's other ways to handle a migration too, that would be uh, less like, I guess, faster too. Like you could spin up a, a new Bitcoin 2.0 that was already quantum, quantum resistant from Genesis and allow right. people to do like a, until, until like that encryption is broken while people do like a burn to redeem or something type thing no burned. it'll be like emblem vault like we'll have old yeah old sats <laughs> in new bitcoin <laughs> containers <laughs> like no man i got that old og bitcoin <laughs> that real real yeah <laughs> yeah it's well, gonna be um, crazy by then yeah yeah i mean again it's i'm i'm excited about like I, again, you know, it, I don't look at it as a negative. I just think it's, it's stuff to be aware of, you know, so I didn't mean to be a downer, but. Um, oh, no, I don't think of any of it as like, uh, like negative, really. Yeah. You know, I just think of it more as like, it's just the way things are, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's okay to bring up things that uh, like might be problems, because if you don't, like you're saying, then uh, maybe something bad does happen. Yeah. Well, you know, and I wanted to get too, so um, to, to talking a little bit more about the, your VR experience. So, you know, like I, I was, like we had talked before, like I, I initially thought, and I even um, wrote a little bit about it too. I initially thought, like believed in the, like the metaverse narrative in the, in the, in the way that other people were talking about it and kind of like the Decentraland voxels or uh, crypto voxels or, you know, something like that, where you have kind of like this big shared experience that was like monolithic i i guess is for lack of a better word but um you know we were talking about it and you were you were explaining how really the like all the usage is is on completely different platforms and a different scale can you kind of uh explain your like how you found out about the these uh platforms and, and what your experience has been uh yeah so i think i have about 500 hours into uh vr chat now this is like i don't know for for lack of a better way of putting it kind of like a i don't know new metaverse i think there's going to be a lot of them but i think this just happens to be the most popular one it's uh you can get to it through quest or through the computer uh it's on steam also and there's like twenty thousand concurrent players like uh, at some point throughout the day, like every day. So it's not like a lot of people, but it's definitely like a small town worth of people that are there all of the time. Um, so I kind of set out like trying to figure out if like a metaverse exists and if so, like kind of where we're at or like what it is, what it would be, what it would look like. Um, and I think after spending a couple hundred hours in it, like, it really is kind of the start of something. It's definitely going to be something. And uh, it's it's really like a new kind of social media that just hasn't existed yet. 
And I think like every great kind of like leap in social media, it just does the same things a little bit differently. So when you add in VR and uh, you're able to like have spatial experiences with people, it's just better than having like, I don't even know what you call it, like a one dimensional experience. Like when I'm on a Twitter space and I'm listening to somebody talk, let's say it's like a small room, there's like 20 people in it or something. Mm-hmm. Um, the difference between that and that environment or doing that in VR when you are in a room with those 20 people, it's suddenly the difference between like a social experience that you have in the real world and something that's like just kind of like faking it in a way. So like, I don't know. I be, I became a, a real believer. I was a real skeptic at first. I mostly play like competitive video games. I'm not really much for like social games at all. So I don't think the metaverse is something that would have like pulled me in at all. Um, but I did find myself like wanting to log in and go see what was going on, like see what people were up to because there is kind of like a, I, I don't even know how you put it. It is kind of just like a different reality that's going on all the time that you can access anytime. Yeah, that's, it sounds fascinating. You were describing people, um, you know, in VR chat, it's, it's not monolithic. It's more of a, well, decentralized is kind of maybe a trite way to put it, but there's, there's smaller spaces that you're able to, like you find out about either through a directory or through word of mouth, right? Uh, Yeah, I think that's probably the most deceptive thing about it is actually Mm -hmm. When you hop on it, I mean, I still think of it as just kind of like a game, right? But it's kind mm-hmm. of like, it reminds me a lot of like AOL uh, chat rooms back in the day. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. Fairly mm-hmm. unmoderated, like some really smart older people, a lot mm-hmm. of like trolley kids who have like a, got a quest for Christmas or something. And you have to make it through some like layers, like make some friends before mm-hmm. you start like getting down into kind of like where the community really exists because there's all kinds of weird communities in there. There's like, like dancers, like real life dancers, like, uh, that do like, I don't know, break dancing and stuff are doing that in VR. And there's probably, I don't know, thousands of them. Um, there's like DJs, there's a like club kind of nights going every single night with like 80 to a hundred people in like these big venues with live DJs playing. That's incredible. Um, yeah. It's really quite wild once you like get in there. Also mm-hmm. it's, it's really strange because piracy doesn't seem to be a thing that they care about. I don't know if you're not supposed to talk about it or not, but like one of the top worlds all the time is a movie world where you can just go in with friends and watch any movie you want. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. And so like the difference in experience from like, you know, like watching a YouTube or a movie or something by myself at night, you uh-huh. know, compared to like getting a couple friends and like watching it in VR is such a different experience that I think that people are going to, uh, it, it, it's like the thing that'll get people off TikTok will eventually a, be VR. That sounds incredible. The other thing that occurred to me too, when you were talking about like the DJ thing is imagine, you know, I remember back in the day, I bought some turntables and I never really like got anywhere with it. Cause I, I wasn't that serious. But, um, I mean, imagine being able to crack, like for someone who wanted to like craft their skill at, at like being a DJ, you know, and like to have a live audience to practice with, like in a virtual world where, hey, like the consequences if you if you fuck up are like there's no consequence. You can create a new profile or whatever if you embarrass yourself or whatever. But it gives you like a real audience to to play for and and, and hone your craft. I mean, that sounds incredible too. Yeah, I think a lot like other social media, th- I don't know things when it comes to marketing and stuff. Like, there's always going to be strange opportunities. I think Mm -hmm. something like DJing is a great example of like something that, you know, maybe not that great in like Facebook or something. If you have like three people that want to see you do it, 
Um, but yeah, you can do it in VR and the barrier to entry is just so low. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is, uh, there's like one night a week that they have this like weird open mic thing. And mm -hmm. I ended up like, you know, finding the guy who runs it or whatever. Uh, so he's like on my friends list. And so every week he runs this thing for like four or five hours, like an open mic. I'll hop by and there's people doing like playing piano or singing songs or like just all kinds of weird, like talent show type stuff and things that you wouldn't really see on like Twitter, you mm -hmm. know, but at the same time, like there's a, uh, like fake bar levels where it's like a piece, you need a PC uh, to get mm -hmm. into it. So it's a bit of an age restriction, like mm -hmm. you know, not as good as maybe I would like, but like, you know, at least there's like some barrier to entry and uh, you know, you'll hear people talking about politics or like normal, like bar stuff, mm -hmm. sports, you know? So it's, uh, I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting experience for sure. Yeah. That's interesting. You mentioned the uh, friends list. How do people, like how do people like keep in touch in like for VR chat? Are they using like Steam friends lists or, or is there an integrated like friends list within the the the, the So there is an integrated friends list, but it's mm -hmm. very basic. Like you can like invite people or request to be invited like by people. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's no like messaging aspect. So everybody actually uses Discord. So which okay. is kind of funny because you know so many of the crypto people use Discord, but all of the uh, the VR kids are on Discord also. Oh, interesting. Well, that's that's the uh, that's kind of funny. Um, I'm I'm sure that that I mean it seems like native integration is a no brainer in the future. But um, well, yeah. So interesting. So um, you know, I know we we talked briefly before. So how you know for these experiences in in terms of of like, are there any services that, like, within the these VR universes, you metaverses that require payment? How how do people, like, or if tipping or whatever? How are people like, how how are people doing payments and buying and selling and and whatnot? It is mostly done through Cash App. So, like, uh, begging for money on the internet is always a thing. I think, yeah. right? Even if you're on Twitter, like, people always want you to send ETH somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so people are always begging for money to their cash app. Like all these kids have cash app and none of them have a crypto anything. <laughs> and when I, when I say kids, like I'm a little bit older, uh, but I'd say like the average age of the people I run into are like maybe 21 to 27, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, definitely like a generation below me, but yeah, discord and cash app and, uh, none of them have uh yeah they've heard about bitcoin but none of them have ever owned any bitcoin which is a bit ironic because man it's like the perfect system for crypto like vr and crypto are going to be like peanut butter and jelly but uh the communities don't really talk to each other hmm. interesting because you would think it would be easy because you know if you had crypto you could i don't know how that like if they do this like with cash app but you could just have like a qr code and and for your for Bitcoin payments or or whatever crypto you want, and it would be pretty seamless to integrate that with a with a web wallet or or whatever. Oh yeah, or like Strike, you know, yeah. like it's all so easy now. Um, but they don't know, and most of them think it's a scam. And also, the the interesting thing is too is one of the things that's popped up over the last couple of months is uh, posters. There's posters with advertisements all over now. Um, so I don't know if like, you know, someone's getting some ad money, but it seems to be like the world creators, but mm -hmm. man, instead of like posters, advertising, whatever weird little VR thing, mm -hmm. uh, it is the perfect place for NFTs to go up. So like people have these home worlds and, mm -hmm. uh, you, you have to make them in unity. It's like a video game engine. So like the barrier to entry on making your own world is like, it's very difficult. I'm pretty good with computers and it's you know, it'd probably take me a hundred hours. Like it's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. but people do this, they spend all these time making these elaborate like home worlds so they can like show them off and to like, there's no NFTs integrated into it at all now. Wow. But like people are absolutely going to have NFTs on their wall just as like status, <laughs> you know, totally. because yeah. like, how could you not like, if you, if the, metaverse vr becomes a thing as much as i think it will 
you go to your buddy's house and he has a board ape, there's no way he's not having a huge statue of that board ape in the middle of his like metaverse home world, you know? Totally. Yeah. But I, I tell you what, I have not seen one board ape. I haven't seen one crypto punk. I mean, and it's been months and hundreds of hours. I have seen a couple Pepe's here and there, but like pretty far and few between. Uh -huh. Um, and like, uh, you don't even hear people talk about NFTs because you're kind of like drowned out by booze as soon as you bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the, the, like the assumption that you're, you're a, a filthy scammer or something, right? Exactly. Exactly. Well, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. I guess there really is almost zero overlap because like you said, like, you know, for, for people who own like the, like their pride and joy, whether it's a crypto punk or board ape or or you know nakamoto or whatever you know they're gonna have like in their in their actual house they'll have like you know a poster or a painting or whatever print out of their their punk or their ape or whatever and, and they're definitely going to do that want that in their their metaverse too so yeah that's mm -hmm. really fascinating well and you know what's interesting i was going through photos the other day and i took a screenshot of it was uh, I think it was like DJ Pepe's sixth birthday or something. I think Skrilla did like a thing. I think it was on voxels maybe, but like mm -hmm. one of those random join through my browser metaverses or whatever I went to and like juxtaposing that with going mm -hmm. to VR chat where there's like more people in a club, but like a good percentage of them are using like full body trackers. And mm -hmm. like some of them even have like eye and face tracking, like on their headsets now. So they're like, you... you're like present, like in a 3D, like it feels like a, a very real environment compared to like whatever we were doing in voxels. You know, it's a flat 2D experience. Like you're not talking to other people. You're like, they're kind of like watching like the other one. It's like, you're really in a club. Like there's small groups of people that are like talking and hanging out. You know, like you can go like butt into like a group of five or six people, like start talking to them. Like, it's not like all the crypto metaverses where almost like, I don't even know if that's possible in any of them. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, well, I've only taken like, and again, it's, it's, uh, it's completely different technologies, but you know, I've used uh, like crypto, like Decentraland and like crypto voxels just a couple of times. And um, and, I'm, and again, like I know that these are like first gen technologies. I'm not like knocking them, but it's uh -huh. it's a it's still like in 2023. It's still they're still very janky, and um, it's just not what you would expect, right? And it's not like it's cool. Well, don't get me wrong, it, it's cool, but it's just it leaves much to be desired. Put it that way, right? Right. Well, it sounds like sounds like you're a gamer. Like I'm a gamer. Yeah. I want to yeah. play games. I like crypto. I don't play yeah. crypto games. I've tried. Yeah, totally. I want to like them. Like I, God, I want to like them. I'd love to fall in love with a pay to win something, you know, but zero. I play zero games that have anything That's to do with crypto. Same thing. You know, like the thing that that I keep the example I always bring up is like. That to me seems like would have been like the perfect marriage is something like um something like csgo or um you know one of those games where i mean there's a ton of ways to do it i just think it's it's but like you i i you know i, I haven't played many games the last couple of years but i still i still like it and i want to kind of get back into it a little bit but there's nothing more than i would love to 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 do than even if it's not like pay to earn i i for me, I, I have no interest in like, you know, I have a, you know, I have a real job. I like my, my time's right. So, and I, plus I'm, you know, doing all this other stuff too on the side, like, I'm not going to like the monetary incentive that they could give me to play a game. Is not like, that's not a motivation for me. It'd be more of like, um, it'd be more like the collectible aspect of like the, you know, being able to get like a rare skin or something like that or, or what have you. So um, yeah. Well, something yeah. rare that you also knew that you would keep moving forward. Right. Cause yeah, so exactly. many of them, it's like the game dies off and it's gone, you know, and, and, but like getting something with some permanence, like I can't imagine yeah. my, my back catalog of like crazy game stuff would look amazing mm -hmm. in my fake future VR closet. 
Yeah, and to your point, like I, there's nothing more than I would have loved to have, to be playing games that that like had that integration that was again not done in a super super sleazy way. I mean, again, like just imagine like like swap out CS:GO like their private private bullshit, you know, digital assets with even if it's on like Solana or Polygon or whatever. I mean, just some sort of open blockchain. That, w- that would be a game changer, you know. Again, like you said, I could, um, I could buy the buy the set of skins that, uh, and and cryptographically be able to to prove it that I own the skins that the, um, you know, ninjas in pajamas won like during the like one of the like world championships and they won, right? I mean, how how what, and then use it use it myself and like in games when I was playing, you know, I mean, what kind of flex would that be? Be pretty, pretty freaking dope, right? (laughs) Right. Well, and it's like, there's so many experiences that people have where kind Mm -hmm. of like, I mean, you feel like you own your digital property, right? Like, I feel like I own my Steam library, but Mm -hmm. I know deep down, I do not own my Steam library. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like each one of those games should be tokenized, right? Like it should be mine. And there's so many items that are like that because so much of our life is digital now. I'm not so sure that like a tweet shouldn't be like that, you know? So it's like, I think everything is going to get tokenized. It makes a lot of sense, especially with video games. But like, I think it's hard to make video games. And I think uh, crypto has just been moving too fast, Mm -hmm. right? So eventually we're going to get a great indie game that's going to be somehow tied in with crypto and it will be like the crypto punks of, you know, real crypto games but like man i have not seen it yet i agree i think it's going to be an indie that's going to come out of nowhere the other example i i liken it to is um you know had like PUBG and Ex- escape from tarkov there are these games that weren't they weren't by like these huge super huge studios that had all the money in the world like division or bethesda or you know all these like um you know whatever there's there's all these ea or anything like that but they like the amount of money they made off of and the run again runaway independent success of of PUBG was uh was amazing you know i don't yeah. see why we I, I think it's i think it's inevitable i'm just waiting to see what it's going to be like i i have no no doubt that someone like we're not the only people waiting for it and the people that see the opportunity some there's got to be a few people with some funds in the gaming community that that like see the see the it, the, it the feels main. too good conceptually to yeah. like not have a way to work like i don't know what that way to work is for sure other than like you know realizing that a lot of stuff is going to become like it's just going to be on the blockchain because why wouldn't it but like yeah. other than that like you know there's some gameplay mechanics that can fit into it and some fancy stuff and i'd even say like uh you know those games probably took more effort to make than among us among us was huge right mm-hmm. and uh it's just like a 2d like yeah almost an nes looking game mm-hmm. so like you can have something that's made by just two or three guys but if they're crypto guys also like someone's going to figure out that combination yeah it, it just seems like yeah it seems like a no-brainer um so so you so people are people are allowed to essentially use um they can use a, a unity to build their own essentially private metaverses so how do they like if i create a like a level or a metaverse how do i publish that with, um with vr chat and how do i how do i get other people to visit that how does that work yeah so it's still uh it's still really centralized cuz it's all through like one game uh-huh. Um, but you, you can create and like upload your own world. So it is like it, most of it's user generated, uh-huh. uh, and with the avatars also. Um, so it's not that hard really making it in unity is hard, but unity is also free. Uh-huh. Um, so like, if you know how to do it, it's a lot like making, um, like just a room in a video game. Like think mm-hmm. of any like 3d video game ever, like that room, like you know, it's 50%, it's made in unreal 50%, it's made in unity. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, that's kind of what it takes. But like, there's a lot of people uh, learning how to do this, like from that. Yeah, I was just thinking that, um, 
you know, it, there'll definitely be a cottage industry or a little like online hustle of people, people helping you do this for, for, you know, again, there's where crypto comes to too. I mean, I guess you can use cash app too, but you know, being willing to do a little hustle where, Hey, I'll like you tell me what you want and I'll, I'll mock you up something in, in unity for your, your private world. Right. Oh yeah. Well, and this is where I think the NFT, like this is another area where it just makes sense. Right. Like people are creating these avatars and spending hours on them and getting them done in commissions and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but then like through different programs and things, people can just copy them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. and so like people's avatars can then get copied through like a hacker or something and like they can just be all over the place. And so and there's also these creators that this is what they are doing. I don't know if it's a side hustle or a real job, but they're making avatars. But mm -hmm. like all of them are like, hey, after you buy this, like please don't give it to somebody else. <laughs> like I mean, please don't give it to somebody else works a little bit on the internet, you know, but like <laughs> <laughs> it, it would make a lot more sense if there was like a way to, I don't know, prove ownership of a thing that was already built into the system. Um, and like you said, if, if you're, if you have, I mean, I, again, it's, it's early and, and, you know, I, I'm not using VR chat as the, as it, with the expectation that that's going to be the system that wins out. This is just the example we're talking about right now. Cause eventually I think they'll, it would make sense that we'll have like an open system where, you know, um, you know, it's not necessarily centralized, but, um, but at least for now, like, yeah, it makes sense. There would, there would at least be a framework or a plugin system um, that were, again, you could have frames where you, like you would allow the user to be able to swap out what NFTs that they're showing in those different frame. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, there's a, when you look at it all through like a crypto lens, there's a lot mm -hmm. of problems that, it seems would be solved through crypto solutions. Just, you know, it's just not happening yet, <laughs> but it will. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, and I'm going to have some rare Pepe's uh, on my uh, walls for my uh, virtual home world. It's going to be great. I mean, my grandkids could, are going to think I'm the coolest. What, I mean, what could be a better flex than having uh, having some dope uh, OGs and fake rares, man? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm going to have like Tupac playing and I'm going to have uh, the what is the dank one from season one, series one. Rare oh, Pepe's you, big poster on the wall. You have that? No, no, no. This, it's on my list. Between oh, that okay. one and the, yeah. uh, what is it, the Dre... Is it Dre and somebody else on there for the other one? Oh, yeah, yeah. I know one. what you're talking about. Yeah, the uh, Still Pepe. Still Pepe, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Dre is on there. Yeah, those, uh, those are the two I want on my future virtual wall. That's uh, life goals right there. Fake life goals. Man, I, I still uh, I don't have one of those uh, dank Pepes yet either. That's, man, yeah, super dope. So, you know, oh, yeah. Lyric Series 1. I mean, that's absolutely great to be. Yeah. Yeah. The, the more I look at other things, the more I still go back to the first series rares. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, when I think about things that, you know, you know, it, it's easy to get caught up in the, in the, like almost the hustle of collecting. But in, when I look back at the stuff that I've collected, some of the things that bring me the most joy to just look at and appreciate are, you know, like, um, ufo pepe like mm, yeah. you know i i it's how can you not smile when you look at ufo pepe it's just it's so freaking dope um yeah i mean uh yeah i mean i, I really love the uh love so many of the rares and, and fake rares that i've been able to collect and i feel i also feel really lucky that i've had the opportunity um i i, I still don't think like i don't see how it's going to be possible in the in I don't know how long it's going to take, but you know, if NFTs are still around, which I think they will be, I don't see how it's going to be like affordable for normies to be able to buy a, like a one of 100 or even like a one of 300 it's like in a global population that are getting plugged into these online, like, you know, online systems, how, I don't know. It, it seems like, like, it just seems impossible for that, that it would be so easy to, to, you know, for a normie to be, buy something 
you know, from essentially like, like this very innocent golden age of crypto, essentially, you know? Yeah, essentially. Like we, we could be in like a big gold rush in a way because, you know, like they're not making more crypto punks. Well, they're making a lot more crypto punks, but they're just not making <laughs> the original <laughs> crypto punks. <again. laughs> there is a healthy supply of crypto punks. I'm amending my statement. Uh, unhealthy supply you know as, <laughs> yeah. uh, as even as someone who like you know i was i was fortunate enough to buy one um before they really blew up like crazy blew up i still paid a lot of money at the time but um even as someone who owns one it's like like even i'm like you know like please guys can we can we just can we just chill a little bit like we don't need it on it's it's kind of like that meme of of having doom run on every every computing platform and every like electronic device ever made. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's so true. It's like yeah, but does it crypto punk? <laughs> exactly. Not it's not a real <laughs> cryptocurrency until it can crypto punk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if we're right, I mean. If NFTs is going to become a thing, I kind of think like we're doing e-commerce like before the 2000 crash and like your parents are telling you it's stupid to buy something with your credit card on the internet because it's going to get stolen. Yeah. So, you know, a couple more years, <laughs> everybody comes <laughs> around eventually. Yeah, I know. Right. Well, you know, I, I guess, uh, and to kind of keep it real too, you know, um, you know, like I've a lot of the stuff I, I've collected just for my own personal amusement anyway. So like hey, even if no one else comes along, I like I personally enjoy having like, you know, most of the stuff that I've collected I, I really love. So, you know, I I'm having fun regardless. Even if even if no one else comes along for the ride, I'll just be be in the back of the nerd bus alone. <laughs> oh yeah. I just don't want to be last in line anymore. You know, like yeah. I feel like I'm just still kind of last, like I, I need more new people to come in. So I feel like an OG, you know, I don't know how yeah. many years that <laughs> takes, but I'm not there yet. I still feel like I'm still pretty new. So, and it's been, I don't know, a good I, three years now anyways. So. I think one thing that's giving us this, like this, that's helped drive this bear market, but also that's like, like as we're talking in, you know july 2023 is you know the nft market is really down bad and you know crypto is is still you know still in a rough state and we're in bear market but i think one thing that's driving that to a large extent is the um i think the economy in the u.s is in a lot worse shape than people let on you know i mean um you know our our government's been cooking statistics for years and years so I, I think there's a lot more pain in the economy than they're letting on. Um, and that's just like, I see, I think we see that in our space through the lack of liquidity um, and the, like, if you need to sell something, um, I mean, you, you have to be willing to accept like fire sale price, like crazy liquidation prices in order to get anything to move right now. I mean, it's just, it's just dry. Like people don't have, have capital. So. It is dry. I, you know what? The one positive I'd say is, especially in the Pepe stuff, I haven't seen that mm -hmm. much panic selling. Yeah, which is nice. Yeah. So I think oh, just the, for the collection, there's a bit more like stronger hands, and people are more used to this stuff. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. Um, but yeah, I but you know, the thing is, is you know all this stuff. So, I mean, we both know what happens next, right? So if times get tough, what do they do? They're gonna mm -hmm. flood the zone with money. When they flood the mm -hmm. zone with money. <laughs> NFTs are going to go up again and like, uh, and it will be really fun and I won't sell. I still won't sell. I'll try to buy more and they'll probably be too expensive. I'll probably crash again, but like, man, it'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, um, um, I think it's going to be fun to see how it, um, to see how this next market cycle works out in terms of like what the winners are going to be. Like if things like, the capacity of Bitcoin matter. Like if we're going to like, we are, we had like a, when the ordinals and the stamps were taking off, we had like another, like wasn't as bad as 2017, but we started to see like the fees get crazy again. That was like a little bit of a warning sign. So, I mean, I don't know, like I, I could easily see Solana like pop off again for, you know, they've been, they've been continuing to execute in terms of like 
having a high TPS chain. I hopefully they'll be able to make it a little bit more reliable and resilient. And um, I mean, I don't know. It'll just be, you know, again, it, like every every chain can have its own like niche too. You know, like Tezos has its like interesting like like art scene too, and it, they've been working on you know their own strengths too with uh, you know their um you know their uh, decentralized governance and all of that so i don't know it'll, it's just going to be fun to see i i don't i know there's it's it's super dead right now but i don't think it's going away so um but yeah if I, you had to put all your chips on uh one thing moving forward so for the for the next bull run all you have to take everything you have consolidate put it on one bet where are you going oh that's a great question so um i think you know i and maybe it's just my bias but like what comes to mind is either probably rare Pepe's or, or Ethereum tiles, you know, I mean, yeah. probably rare Pepe's OG rares. Yeah. I, you know, I have a hard time not thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, but for, uh... for me, I don't know about you, but for me, it's hard to even like, I, my collection is almost entirely singles i don't have very many dupes because i've just been trying to get as like as comprehensive a collection as possible so i don't have a lot of stuff that i'd be willing to let go so you know <laughs> it's kind of hard to think about uh about unloading but um you know I, yeah hoping, you know. i only have one double of any note and that's a vvd utility token i bought three initially i still have two and one. I can't get rid of it. <laughs> it was a, it was a, a card for a while that like he would do giveaways. If you had like the utility token plus something mm -hmm. else, like, I think that's how I got this moon bird actually. Oh, okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just like the Mona Lisa and then across like the eyes, it says utility, not included. No. Oh, okay. I love it. It's a great piece, but yeah, it's my, my only double I have. I put it up for sale all the time. Is it ever going to sell? I don't think so. But one day, maybe. <laughs> uh, how about you? What would you um, uh, like if you had to, if you had to pick a single like, again, like if you had to pick something that I guess you, I guess what we're talking about is like an eventual long term flip. What would you, what would you be doing? You know, I think the safest DGen play would just be to do ETH. Yeah. You know, like, because I think you'd still get a multiple on Bitcoin possibly. Yeah. Um, but like, I'm with you. I actually think, uh, a Nakamoto card is the way I would go. Like if I had to yeah. pull it all together, I couldn't, yeah. I don't think I could quite afford a Nakamoto card yet, but like maybe one of these days, but I think that's, I think that would be the play. There's just not enough of them for uh how good i think they are and how like like prominent in history i think it is i mean they're really iconic i mean um uh -huh. it's one of the most um i mean it's, it's such an important piece but it's also like one of the most memed assets in all of crypt in all of the nft space too you know at least within the bitcoin scene so um right yeah i mean i that's a good point. I've I've always wanted to get a second Nakamoto to eventually flip so I could still have my my first one, you know. So <laughs> Oh, it'd be real nice if I had like a million dollars to have one to sell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, cuz think of all the other NFTs you could buy with that money. It'd be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I think uh yeah, I think that's a good call. Like the rare Pepe's is such a like I think one of the things that really drives you that like sucks you into is how how complex and deep the the entire collection is in terms of like you know the rarities and the um and the availability and the market and it's, you know it's um, so authentic 
I think yeah. is what does it for me. Like mm -hmm. none of them meant to do it. It's just this crazy art collective that like happened to come together like at this time. Yeah. You know, like there's nothing else like it. It's not like yeah. a PFP of some kind or. I mean, imagine how different the vibe would have been. You can just imagine it. Like if Mike charged 10% or, or whatever, like to like, or charge a thousand dollars or hundred dollars or whatever it is like for submissions, you know, it wouldn't be the same at all. It'd be a completely different vibe. Yeah. Well, and was there wouldn't have even been enough people back then to do it probably, yeah. you know, if it cost that, cause that's how like crazy it was. Like you would know this, but like, what was the, the first cost of the Nakamoto card? Wasn't it like a hundred bucks or something? I don't, I don't even know. It was super cheap. Um, uh, I think he gave away the first, didn't he give away the first few? I don't know. Oh, but they probably. Were, they were, they were really cheap uh, at the time. I think, uh, I think the number I heard was 50 or a hundred dollars. So um, at first, I mean, crazy. Yeah. I mean, but one thing I've consistently heard from people uh, that I've talked to is that, um, is that Nakamura's are always, always just out of reach. You know, it's like, <laughs> uh, it's so true. Well, because when you have liquidity, other people have liquidity. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You got to be smart enough to have it when other people don't. And like, I sure haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> <laughs> even though conceptually i know it but man i get it and i spend it i know it's it's kind of a problem <laughs> kind of a problem yeah i mean um, uh yeah i mean i think that's really and, and again like like with with rares too is even if they even if they're not worth anything in the future i like you said i i really just appreciate the the art and the era that they and the they stand for and the the uh, the integrity and authenticity of the project. I just think it's it's super rad. If they're not worth anything, I'm buying more and I'm gonna get two full arm sleeves of like tattoos of ones that I own. <laughs> yeah, I mean, be like uh, eighty. It's gonna be great. Yeah, I mean, and and to your point too, like I I guess in terms of be, like being safe. Yeah, I have a like I have a hard time thinking that owning a couple of validator nodes is a bad idea in the you know medium term, you know. I mean F is yeah, still true. It's still Man, the juggernaut. F those guys though. I can't even I mean, we're late enough in the podcast, right? Where I can yeah. just say how shitty ETH is. But uh I was doing pretty good mining. Like, and they're like, Oh, we're gonna go away from proof of work because we need lower fees and like fees are so high now <laughs> like those motherfuckers just kicked me out basically and are now taking it for themselves i hate them all so much <laughs> well you know the thing is that i i assumed in the switch to proof of stake that would also like allow them to increase the base tps and it didn't i was like or at least meaningfully i was like yeah because fees didn't didn't like really go down after that i was like what yeah they did for a little bit but like yeah. i don't know i was minting a couple weeks ago and it was like over 50 bucks to mint and i was going to do something else it was too expensive I'm like like what is this what do, why it's a bear market is like i didn't even think it was using this i know right <laughs> yeah why are the fees so high what happened here i feel like i've been bamboozled i've been bamboozled before and this is what it usually feels like i i do wish that they um uh, that they had some more L1 scaling on the roadmap, you know, like, um, I know that they're, they're trying to, to push a lot of stuff onto L2, but I mean, you know, it's not, not there yet. And I mean, you still have to have a, a, like a decent amount of TPS, even if it's not crazy, like, like Solana or something, you still need to have something decent on. Uh, on well, the it's really interesting on like, which one of these really scale. Like mm -hmm. to like a meaningful world impacting level. I don't know if ETH does, you know, I don't think yeah. it's been proven yet. No, it definitely has not been proven. So like all these L2s and stuff, they like, I mean, we can sit like, that's like running, you know, running in a dev environment, like, like the families have gone mainstream and, and done crazy TPSs yet. And um, I guess one, you know, 
the other thing too is most of these most of these L2s or or rollups that I've I've seen or read about, they have security compromises, right? In terms of like with Polygon, there's only like what six keys or something. Um, right. Yeah. You know, like it, it, you're you don't have the same security model as you have at the base layer, right? Where um, you know, if we're, if we're actually going to be transacting like big value, and and this is going to be the settlement layer for the for the world or the internet, right? Like, it has to be again, like the the stakes are so high, it has to be bulletproof. Like, we can't have a like a second tier security model for the um, for that too. So that's another thing. I I think there's there may be a a roll up or something that that doesn't have the I don't know. It, like, it's hard to keep up with all of it, but that's the it, earlier It is one. so hard to keep up with it, especially because it gets so technical. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely I remember, I remember to... looking at like ZK rollups, like, uh, and I don't know, what, like a year <laughs> ago now, and yeah. knowing the difference between that and whatever the other rollup was that was happening, yeah. because I was trying to figure out what shit coin to buy at the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. I'm I by by no no means uh trying to pretend like I understand it, like all the intricacies of this stuff. It's well, just and just think level. like how much we're in it and we're like, why can't normal people figure this out? <laughs> <laughs> well, because that imagine? that spiel about like that you just did about more secure and whatever and you could have put yeah. at the end like and that's why I think that we should all go to Pulse Chain because <laughs> Pulse Richard Hart really sure cool. has this shit figured out. <laughs> we need to buy some And I'd be like, you. yeah, you know, I mean, hey. <laughs> it's all about narrative. Well, uh, you know, the other thing too that um that I think um I think is a real downside for the approach that F is taking in that and that is that um you know to like to switch between these different environments like for a normie, that's confusing for them to have to jump between like mainnet and polygon or or you know whatever whatever network right like impossible. I mean, although I'm numb to it now, yeah. like your first time sending a hundred dollars to somebody over just regular ETH, like just using the ETH wallet, yeah. like all that stuff, it it feels like you're literally burning money in front of your face. Let alone like when you do it when it's thousands of dollars. You're just like, <laughs> all right, here we fucking go. Let's hit the button and hope to God it shows up. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, especially with big transactions, even if you're double checking the address and everything. Oh god, uh, yeah. You're using and sometimes they just take a while and you're yeah. certain that you've lost all your money. <laughs> but then it just magically shows up because you know you got bumped a couple blocks. Yeah, it's, and um, I don't know. I, I just think we've got, um, but, but like, like to what you were saying earlier too, like I don't take for granted, like, or assume that anything's going to win in terms of like the, the user adoption race. I think that's to be seen. Like F, F is in the front running, but like, again, it's, I think they have a lot of technical debt and um, it's, it's not a, it's not a sure thing, right? I mean, as lo as much as people like to meme and, and you know, it's definitely number one right now. It's not, you know, success is earned. It's not, it's not granted, right? Well, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to believe that we live in that world too, but that's one of the reasons I believe in ETH because they seem somehow protected from some things more than other people. <laughs> well, maybe... <laughs> maybe it'll They're just a bit be more cool. of the anointed ones compared to like bitcoin or you know like you know the xrp or something the, the dark timeline uh uh is actually that most change is gonna be the winner <laughs> <laughs> hey uh you know i've never <laughs> lost money betting on richard hart but man i don't hold his things for very long <laughs> <laughs> you know i he is like the um you know, like I used to make fun of like Charles Hosh Hoshkinson and all that stuff, oh, but, uh -huh. but, you know, in terms of like being like the most flagrant, like carnival barker scammer, I mean, man, he, Richard Hart really takes the cake, man. <laughs> oh, just in a league of his own. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, cause like, uh, I didn't really deep dive. Like I was very familiar with Bitcoin and pretty familiar with Ethereum. But mm -hmm. when COVID hit and I suddenly had a lot of extra time, I'm like, hey, I'm going to figure out crypto. Like, I'm going all in. Like, what are the top 200 coins? Like, 
And uh, between Richard Hart, Charles Hoskin, and like BitBoy, BitBoy Crypto, uh, nope. like when you come into the space, those are who you find. <laughs> Like, oh, God. I, and I watched a lot of the stuff from all of them. And, you know, like eventually you make it to the whatever Jack Maulers or, mm-hmm. you know, whoever I, I would say like Pompliano. I'm not so sure. Uh, but, you know, like there's some good people out there. But like thinking that like normal people are going <laughs> to wade through all of that, like hours and hours of YouTube shit coin shilling. And I then mean, make it out the other side, like yeah, because that's what the algorithm the promotes is these scammers grinding right? factory. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, like people like BitBoy, they don't even really, they don't even really put in any effort to hide the fact that they're scammers. I think he sued a few people for saying that, but you know, I mean, he's very obviously a scammer. You know, so I mean, yeah, I would have to see proof from like wallets that he wasn't to like really believe it. But like, isn't that like the way it is? You know? Yeah. <laughs> but like, hey, when I first got into it, like I bought some like random shit coins because he shielded it and I saw the thing early. I'm like, ooh, I saw that video and it just came out. I bet people are going to buy that. <laughs> 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 you know, that but man, me. you better get rid of it quick because they're going to someone's about to dump on you, too. So did that, did that work like buy it like the, the minute the video is published and dump like 20 minutes later? <laughs> yes. 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 It, did. <laughs> yes it, did. It, was about, it, it was like a four to six hour delay was the sweet spot. I've had some really weird uh theories on how to squeak out some ETH here and there. <laughs> so, you know, that, yeah, that, that was one of them. One of my one of my favorite memories with uh with a certain coworker is who was getting involved in um day trading um back in like 2016, 2017, 2018-ish somewhere in, in there and um he started day trading um while he was at work in the morning <laughs> and he he legit told me that he, he had this brilliant strategy where he would he would read the news and buy like buy whatever whatever company was mentioned in the news and, and sell later and he expected to make like i don't know 20 percent a week or something and <laughs> oh man that adds up 20 percent a week and uh, well, I, I remember myself and another coworker warned him that one that's like that's like such a basic like that's so dumb like it's so it's too obvious like what are you even talking about it's so and stupid he, it might just work <laughs> well you know and and you know for like for like five days or something it, it like uh he was talking about trading and then and then uh one day i hear i can't sell fast enough <laughs> it's just like absolutely rugged on something <laughs> oh man yeah, oh, I lost all my faith in that system. You know, it's funny. It's like once you like look into something or participate in something, like I lose all faith in it and I have to like move on. Yeah. <laughs> so like uh, I was uh, doing Robin Hood when the GameStop stuff happened. Oh, no I, way. I, yeah, yeah. I wake up to like, hey, you can sell, but we're not allowing anybody to buy this anymore. <laughs> like, like, oh, I hate you. Yeah. This is why I don't play your game your banker games <laughs> you're always <laughs> you're always cheating uh yeah scumbags <laughs> yes yeah, so that was the last stocks i bought i've been out ever since then like i hate all of them so much yeah i know right Jeez, that's brutal yeah i mean yeah. to pull the pull the hunt brothers thing all over again you know uh i know right i thought this time this time the the good guys would win for sure uh who would have thought <laughs> <laughs> who would have thought that the uh the banks would save in to, to save themselves and the cronies oh man well hey there was another you know you're talking about the etfs or whatever forever ago that was another situation where they were covering with uh like their naked short selling kind of yeah. the same thing they do everywhere right they're just always yeah. selling and they don't have it like yeah. it's amazing yeah i mean hey it, uh, like it's one of those things I, I view it almost as like like being mature enough to to recognize where like you can say it even on a larger scale, but at least this this country and like the the government and the systems work is that it's just naked corruption, naked grift. If you just scrape behind, you know, the 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 veneer of pretty much any institution in the U.S. anymore, it's just it's just pure corruption. You know. Mm. Okay, I see what you're saying. So you're saying that we should become corrupt and start naked short selling Pepe's. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so naked I mean, short I mean, sell Pepe's step two question mark step three lots of Bitcoin. I, I think I figured it out. Like we need to naked short sell a bunch of Nakamoto's and then buy them up cheap, right? <laughs> hey, there you go. That's yeah. How do we do that? How do we sell fake Nakamoto's that we don't <laughs> own and will never own? Oh man, we need a banker. We yeah, need to get a banker right? for the third person on this scam. I, I'm sure they could tell us how to pull this off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They've got the experience. Uh, well, um, yeah, I mean, we've kind of jumped around a little bit. Um, in terms of your your VR experience, like, um, is there any other, are there any aspects of your experience you really want to call out? Or is there anything you wanted to really, like, highlight in terms of what you, like, what you think is going to be coming next or what you're looking forward to in the future? Um, yeah, you know, there, there's a couple things that I think are quite unbelievable, I suppose. And one of them is there's this thing that people talk about called phantom sense where like, it wouldn't seem like it's real, but like people can like feel like if you like, I don't know, like they see their avatar get like touched or something. And this is something that I was a hundred percent sure was fake until I spent too much time in front of a fake mirror. And like, I was wearing an avatar that had ears on it. And like, I could kind of feel my fake ears. And oh it sounds God. ridiculous, right? Because like, I don't have fake ears. And like, you can't really feel them. But it was like, there was enough of a weird tingle, like in my brain that it's like, my brain expected me to feel something almost like there was some weird anticipation of touch that created like a super weird sensation. And there's people that are in there way more than I am. And I don't know like I'm if I'm susceptible to it or not, or some people are more or not, but like that's the level of immersion that happens now. And the other crazy thing that happened to me one time was I was in a world where it was raining and I felt two drops of water like hit my arm. And I thought for sure that there was a leak because uh, my gaming room is in the basement. So I took off my headset and I like felt the ceiling and there was no water and I felt my arm and there was no water. And I realized like, no, my brain just thought that I was gonna get hit by raindrops. And so it made me feel like I'd been hit by raindrops. And so like somehow that's possible and that's like mind blowing because yeah, I do not understand that at all. And that's like the level of presence that's possible now. So like, I can't even imagine because like the avatars aren't that real. The worlds aren't that real. It's not even like cutting edge video game, but it's all just good enough. And it's the first thing I've seen that's good enough that like, like it's crossing some kind of barrier there to where there's like weird things happening. <laughs> Basically, I don't really know how to explain it, but uh, it, it's just going to be different. It's going to be a lot different. Well, I mean, what occurred to me as you were describing that is like, you know, if the if it's that immersive, you know, people are are addicted to like their Twitter or TikTok now. I mean, imagine when people get sucked into these like essentially like alternate universes, alternate realities. I mean, I don't know. That's so it sounds so engrossing, you know? Yeah. Well, and I thought that my dopamine receptors are pretty well like burned out between yeah. like DJ and crypto things and video games from, you know, when I was little. Um, but I don't know if it's just because it's so immersive because the lights are so bright because like what it is exactly, because I only ever really got dopamine from like more competitive kind of like games, especially like, I don't know, in the last 10 years or so from when I wasn't like little. Yeah. Um, but like, this is different and like it, it it really reminds me of TikTok in a way because I'm pretty impervious to like social media. I almost have like an aversion to it, just not my favorite. Mm -hmm. But like the first couple of times I use TikTok, I'm like, oh no no no, this is hitting like a dopamine thing. I'm like, this is really dangerous for normal people. I feel the same way with VR. There's something about it. The dopamine hit is different. There's something way more escape escapism. I don't know something with it like. It, it's just going to addict everybody like everybody's going to be there and if you think like 
no, no, not everybody's going to be there. Like people are sitting on their phone on their couch on TikTok. Yeah. And like exactly. they're really just paying attention to their phone. If they could wear glasses where they could still have passed through when they needed it or wanted it. But when they're in their glasses, they can watch TikTok with their friends in like an environment where like they can see their friends and they can watch and laugh together. Like, why wouldn't you choose that? It's like a better experience. Yeah. It, 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 I was just laughing. I was like, yeah, that's, it sounds like a no brainer, right? You know, I mean, and to think about how, you know, like I was, I was imagining in terms of like, you know, our phone is, you know, using a 2D phone with, like TikTok or Twitter or whatever is like the is like the NES of of the technology for for you know like triggering that stuff. I mean, yeah, when you can you can literally change your perception of not just the phone, but essentially your you know how all your sensory inputs for reality, essentially, right? I mean, how how much more immersive and and um, I don't know, I don't it, yeah, engaging is that going to be? Yeah, I mean, well, and it's just a it delivers a different experience. So like, uh, I think of the Super Bowl sometimes, right? Super Bowl is like an experience. You go to someone's house, you have like a little party, you know, <clears throat> like yada, 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 right? But what if you didn't have access to going to a party like that for whatever reason? You don't have friends, you know, they're not around, whatever it is. But you can go in VR on the 50 yard line and like watch it like you're in the real stadium and have a buddy who's in like another country sitting next to you watching the same thing, experiencing the same thing at the same time. Like, yeah, people are going to do this with a million different applications. Well, and also like, you know, to have a shared experience with friends that, you know, I, you know, especially since I've been in crypto, I know a lot of people that I've never seen their face or I don't even know their real name, but, you know, like we could have, like, I could get up with like these online friends that um, you know, have these shared experiences about, you know, like, you know, having to spend a you know ton of money to go to a conference or, or what, or whatever, you know, I mean, so definitely interesting on, on that angle too, you know? To really oh do. yeah. Well, think about just looking at rare Pepe's, right? Mm -hmm. Like if there was a rare Pepe like world that you could go to and just hang out and other people that are into it happen to stop by along with some trolls and this and that. Yeah. <laughs> right. But like on a big screen, like you can be scrolling through and just talk about it with different people. Like, yeah, I'd be there. I yeah. Imagine there. talking. Yeah. Being able to talk shit, trade cards and you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. But able... like in, in fake person. Yeah, exactly. Dressed up as a, you know, you know, pick the pick the uh, Pepe out of a card of your choice, you know, and you, that's your get up, right? Oh, 100 percent. I think that's why I think my first card is perfect. That's going to be my uh, avatar. I'm going to be a Pepe wearing a suit. With a ridiculous Pepe head. <laughs> um, this is my a... fake future. I've already decided. <laughs> Well, I've already decided that I'm going to be getting a, um, I, I'm going to get a, a modern headset and, and stuff to kind of explore this stuff too, because, um, you know, I, you know, I already, I already have like a glimpse of, of what was coming from that Oculus. And I want to like, you know, experience of where, where it's at now. And, you know, I'm sure I'll get a better sense of where it's going to, um, uh, as well. I, I, I think it's a, it's just fascinating to, um, fascinating that all the all the action 2000 people consecutively is more than um is way more than meadow is able to get on their platform um so you know I don't yeah know. i think it's just a happy accident i think people are looking for it and it just happens to like you know have the right combination for mm -hmm. the time but yeah seeing you walk around uh as a crypto punk that'd be that'd be a real milestone <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm. It's just so wild to hear that no one's using. Again, I know because you think the, you'd see a board ape or something, right? I mean, like, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. it doesn't cost that much to get an avatar made. I'm sure, like, maybe a couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Like, which for crypto people is, you know, nothing crazy. Yeah, it's but, just so funny. yeah, it's, and the flex, the absolute mm -hmm. flex, it would be. I mean, if any of them actually knew what one was, which they don't, but one day they will, and it'll be a flex. 
<laughs> yeah, it's not such a flex when you have to explain to them why it's a flex, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's true. But like, yeah, <laughs> you're like, no, no, this is worth a lot of money, I swear. <laughs> hey, at least uh at least other other nerds i'd be able to show my my private gallery or something you know that's true although watch it like becomes a meme someone's gonna steal yours and then it's gonna become a joke to wear it like ah, right. oh, look i'm valuable yeah right click save you're gonna be the right click save punk <laughs> yeah, uh, just everybody wearing your avatar in the metaverse it, it becomes the default yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if people don't click on something else, they automatically get that one. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. You're like the who's the guy on was it MySpace that everybody was friends with? Yeah, yeah, Tom. Yeah, Tom. You'd be like the Tom of VR. <laughs> Everybody's got your avatar as a starter. Yeah, are there um are there any any other like unique insights or experiences you want to wanted to kind of call out? Or things you're kind of expecting going forward? Um, no, not really. You know, I would just, I mean, I think it's so obvious at this point, even though the crypto universe is kind of yelling about it, but like Apple coming into the space is a huge milestone. And I really think it just shows like, like this is going to happen just because Facebook hasn't been very good at it. Like doesn't mean it's not going to become a thing. Like it's, as inevitable as AI is at this point. And when those yeah. two things get together, <laughs> when uh, you're in a fake world that's populated by people that you're not sure are fake, then we'll be in the real future. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to ask you two quick things. So one is, are there bots in these metaverses yet? Uh, not yet, but I have been keeping track. Uh, you know the game Skyrim? Yeah. So right now there is uh, something where they're adding like chat GPT to people mm -hmm. in Skyrim. Like one of them is like a companion, I think that follows you around and it keeps track of the conversation. And it seems like it's really coming along, mm -hmm. uh, especially cause a couple months ago it was awful. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say not yet, but like we could be days away. Like, and when it happens, it's going to be crazy. Well, yeah, I was just thinking that that would be, um, you know, it's one thing to have spammers and bots and whatnot in a in a two D like a Telegram or a Discord or whatever, but the I don't know the like, how crazy it would be to have like bots in in these virtual worlds and like in like a, a you know VR it will be that'll be another milestone too. <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, and what happens when they, they talk like a human, but then like also their movements in game are like a human. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. like it's going to get really hard to tell people apart real quick. Well, it, it was funny as I, again, so ironically, because they don't have, they're not sophisticated enough to use crypto yet. Well, then again, I guess they use cash app. So it's, it's still money, but you know, you could even, you could even easily predict that they'll just have like pre-programmed like uh, or use an AI with the with the intention, you know, program it to essentially run a long con on people. Like you, you'll have have these these like, <laughs> friendships with these but with people you think are real that are. It's really just a bot that's doing a long con game in order to get you to. <laughs> oh my gosh! This is this is the dystopian future that we all deserve. It is. <laughs> <laughs> or you know like get a bull attacked where you you think you're in a um in a vr chat uh, instance with with a bunch of, and you're the only person in there <laughs> yeah just all of a sudden like the whole world stops and everybody just staring at you and you realize like you're the only real person there that's like yeah. an episode of black mirror or something yeah no uh, no that's that's really fun um and the other thing i was going to ask you because i didn't dig into the specs for the apple headset is um is how does that stack up to the gear that's already out there and and what are your thoughts on the on apple's entry into the space um well i've from just from the things i've watched i think it's uh -huh. going to be really good because i think the thing that apple does that everybody else is terrible at is a user interface Okay. And I think that that is one of the huge puzzle pieces that's been missing. Um, like you put on a quest and like the first thing you see, like you're going into this crazy thing. They can just, I mean, the experiences you can have are wild. 
Mm-hmm. And it instead puts a Facebook login like right in front of your face as the first thing. Like it's the most <laughs> underwhelming experience of all time. And uh, with the eyeball tracking uh-huh. that, um, and no controllers and using your fingers and stuff of the Apple one, I think that it's just going to be almost a total different genre of headset. Mm-hmm. And it could lead to some like real big leaps forward and kind of like like the PC headsets, which I'm more interested in. Because yeah, really, so- if you think about it, like those small computers are getting so fast now mm-hmm. that it's almost there. So another couple of years, I think the standalone headset makes a lot of sense. Well, I mean, especially when you think about like Apple is 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 one of the you know they're a behemoth. They actually have the money to like not just create general purpose; they can actually create like custom tailored chips like ASICs just for particular tasks to make this faster than you could, than you could use using like, you know, you've mentioned like PC gear, you know, like PC stuff's kind of a compromise, you know, because it has to, it's, you know, general purpose, right. Um, for, you know, it has a lot of different like functionalities, like built into a card instead of being purpose, purposely geared just for one specific task. So yeah, I could definitely see them in a, a generation or two, just, just really blowing stuff out of the water there too. So yeah. you can still you can still use that with the PC though, the Apple one. Uh yeah. Well, I mean the the screen and stuff, it, you know, it's so hard to say because it's kind of like if you're back in the day comparing an iPhone to a PC when it came out and you're like, "Well, you can do the same thing, right?" It's like, "Yeah, but it's it's using the thing is almost like the art. Like that's what they're so yeah. good at." Mm-hmm. And so I, I heard like one of the YouTube people that did the thing, they said like the eye tracking was like magic because like you look somewhere and then you just like click your fingers together and it clicks the thing you're looking at. So it's, it's <laughs> like a, yeah. a whole new experience, mm-hmm. like a way of experiencing the computer, you know? So yeah. And complete- we'll, we'll see. Yeah. And a really intuitive, like, intuitive way that you wouldn't even have to really like tune yourself to, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It seems. Yeah. And you know how PCs and like tech people are like the, mm-hmm. like the really geeky DIY crew, like they're much more about making it work with like raw effort and horsepower than making it very easy for normal people. Yeah. So if Apple can figure that out, like, it could get wild quick because Facebook mm-hmm. will learn, you know, they'll copy them. They just weren't yeah. very good by themselves. Yeah, for sure. I remember reading those tweets by Carmack basically, you know, before he quit, he was basically saying that they were, you know, they had like what, probably like two times the number of people they needed to like, and it was actually going slower because they had so much bureaucracy. And I mean, if you're not listening to Carmack, you know, you're, you're messing up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. hundred percent. When they brought him on, that's what gave me hope. Yeah. But, but <laughs> yeah, but, you know, the, the thing is, is it's just getting so much like the barriers to entry on all of it are just getting so much easier. Like every day, like, I think the first like chat GPT, I think four model or something was like $60 million to do like the training on. And like, that wasn't that long ago. And it's already down to like 20 million, like the, mm-hmm. the scale and speed of this stuff right now is like, it's mind blowing for me. And I pay attention to things. So yeah. I can't even imagine how cool this is going to get like really, really quickly. Yeah. I mean, like you were saying the AI stuff, like the J curve, it, it feels like just like yesterday, even though it was like a year, 18 months ago, when like the only thing that was being spit out by it was kind of janky and weird and kind of creepy to like, oh my God, like this is changing everything and it's not a joke any type thing. So <laughs> yeah, really quickly. Yeah, I know. Like <laughs> it was making terrible, terrible pasted together pictures like yesterday. Yeah, exactly. Like that were like surreal in kind of a way, like we were talking about like the, the body sensation or like, um, uh, you know, when you have uh, poor performance in, a, in like those early VR sets, how you get queasy, mm-hmm. like that's kind of almost like how, how like the early AI stuff was, or like, it was like really, I don't know, it just creepy, you know, <laughs> just how they put stuff together. 
just like super non-natural and like I guess just and I guess because uh you probably have that visceral reaction because it's something that is like is alien to your like to our perception it's never you know we've never seen anything like that no and what's crazy too speaking of Carmack <clears throat> he was on uh I think maybe Lex Friedman's podcast but he mm -hmm. was talking about how close we are to artificial general intelligence, which mm -hmm. is like, he's like one of the few people that I trust with computer stuff because like, you know, he's like a computer God to me, basically. Like, I don't know that he can do any wrong. So uh, he was saying though, that probably we're like five baby steps away from general AI and that they were probably pieces of code that we've already written and that it would take people hundreds of lines of code, not like, hundreds of thousands of line of code to do it. We just have to like put it together. So imagine like we're that close to like, like general AI where you could basically have like a friend that's a computer, but at the same time, we're going to get VR that is, I mean, not indistinguishable from real life, but like getting close enough that it almost doesn't matter. And those two technologies happen to be hitting us at the exact same moment. Like you're going to have like a fake best friend, like for real <laughs> in a couple of years. And like, you know, you're just going to go vent to them and they're going to know like all your shit. <laughs> like, Oh, that is like, that is like one of those dystopian things where, where your, your fake best friend is also narking on you to the government. Too. Oh, a hundred percent. Oh, that's why you got to run your own AI. You know, if you're not, if you're not already planning on running your own AI at your house, you're, you're going to get trapped in the real matrix. <laughs> See, that's the key. You want to end up in the fake matrix. You don't want to end up in the real matrix. It's slippery. Yeah. You know, you got to your... be on top of it. Yeah, you got to you got to self host, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got to self host your AI. Oh. No, that's that's I mean, fascinating. I... Yeah, like like you said, if if there's anyone who who would like have an insight, it would be Carmack. He's you know definitely one of the most um influential people in commute computing in, in our lifetime. Uh, the other thing I was, I was thinking the last uh, person I was talking about, we were chatting about it is like, I think as exciting as, as kind of gamers too, is that the democratization and the, the, the exponential like power that individual developers can have in terms of content creation for games and, and like textures and gaming worlds. I'm sure you've seen like, like one example was like the like those uh, generative tools that they have for Unreal Engine like 5.2 and but also like even remastering old games like that Nvidia Remix stuff. I mean, it, I don't know. It's like that's using AI to upscale all the textures and you know redo all the light sources and stuff. I don't know. There's there's like a ton of it's it's it's, it's going to be exciting to see you know what comes out of all this. Like you said, I mean, like all this stuff hitting us all at once. Yeah, well, and if you think about like the J curve with that, because like Unreal Engine 5 point whatever is out now, right? And it's wild. It is absolutely wild. So like computers can already run that. So like my computer is going to be able to run that. But if the AI keeps improving on a J curve, then I'm going to be able to just tell the computer what I want the world to look like, and it's going to be able to make it. So the barrier to entry on like creating games worlds whatever is just gonna vanish like some of these things like it's just going to zero for like the amount of yeah. effort it takes to make something just like i i'm not like an artist that can create like crazy drawings but i use mid journey and i fucking kill it so my yeah. wife doesn't make pepes but she uses mid journey for like stuff for her work and every time she does something, I have her take out the word person and just put in frog now. And she sends me the results. She might be <laughs> one of the most prolific Pepe artists of our time. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because like the effort has gone to zero <laughs> to like make this stuff. So I think the same thing is going to happen with like Unreal Engine. And so like, if yeah. you can go like, make me a jungle, like, no, make there a big tiger over there. No, make it bigger. And it just does this for you. Like it would have seemed impossible if I said that two years ago, if I said that a year ago, it'd be like, that's crazy. It's never going to actually happen. But like now 
yeah, everything I, seems I, possible. <laughs> I mean, and it's not as advanced as you're talking about with being able to just tell the tell the computer like to create this. But I saw a demo, I don't know, a few weeks ago where someone was basically like using one of the AI programs. Like all they had to do is like like draw these boxes for like say like this is an alley and draw these boxes and um and then just basically hit a button and then it automatically generates like like all the textures and all the 3d models and everything to like make it look like a real scene just off of like like these just simple crude boxes and like something you do in like 30 seconds you know it's just again we're, we're creating it at what would we'll take hours and hours worth of of humans uh humans work to to do that so i think that's one reason i think we'll see like you're saying like some crazy indie indie games like a resurgence of of any development you know so some real creativity uh, back into the, wouldn't into that this. be the the bitcoin dream is like from this we're just going to go into an era of decentralization <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that is a dream man it is well, let's well let's leave it there. I think that's a, that's a good note to leave it on. <laughs> I uh, I certainly um, I certainly appreciate you taking the time to to chat with me. I um, I really appreciate your you know your first person uh, uh, insights and and experiences with this stuff. So um, it'll be it'll be fun to we'll have to touch base uh, in the future too and see how this stuff has has been playing out. But it's definitely been yeah. a pleasure. Well, hey, one of these times, uh, maybe we could do this from the metaverse. Yeah, hey, that, that sounds like a plan. Yeah, from the from Pepe Palace. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, in, <laughs> in your your custom world with your new avatar. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a plan. Well, uh, but great, I certainly appreciate it. Yeah, well, thanks for having me.